Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. Pronounced these words in front of the whole class, and longer than that, the unbelievable happened. Naomi was always standing by the fence. She looked at the street where handsome uncles and aunts walked and dreamed that someday she would walk down the sidewalk in a beautiful dress and high heels. And even better, if she was not alone, but with her husband. And ideally, if he would be rich and provide her with everything. The girl doesn't remember how she got to the orphanage, but she knows it was unconscious because she's been here as long as she can remember. Naomi, are you standing by the fence again? The teacher came up to her. She was out of breath. It was obvious that she had been looking for the girl for a long time. Emma, but why can't I stand here? The girl looked at her with pitiful eyes. There's nothing to stand here. Let's go. Everyone lost you there long ago. The woman threatened her with her finger. She took the girl's hand. She lowered her head and they walked back to the building. Why are we forbidden? Naomi asked, because she didn't understand it. Why? Do you think that if you lived with your parents, you would be allowed everything? No, don't think that. We are here taking care of you, so that nothing can happen to you, Emma started to tell her. And what can happen to us, we are behind the fence. Didn't understand the girl. If you ran to the fence, you would have tripped, fallen over a stone, bumped your head, and then who would be responsible, me? The teacher told her. Well, you would have blown me, put some green on it, and everything would have gone away. Naomi was only six years old, so she reasoned like that. Oh, you little one. Emma tried not to get used to the children, not to start socializing with them as her own or as friends, but sometimes it was impossible to do so. They were all so pitiful beyond words. When Naomi went to school, she realized how cruel the world was. Everyone tried to bite, to sass, to do something bad. The girl often cried, but by the fifth grade she realized that if you don't become the same, then all your life you will cry and smear tears on your cheeks. She could answer now too, and not exactly the way the others wanted her to. Naomi, why did you fight with a girl yesterday? The teacher asked her. Why is she picking on me? She won't call me names, the girl sassed. You knocked out two of her teeth, the woman told her. For the rest of her life to remember, Naomi didn't seem to care. But one day she was punished. After that the girl realized something else, you have to do everything quietly, sneakily, then no one will punish you, but you will do everything you want. That's what she started to do. At school, in front of teachers, in the orphanage, in front of tutors, she was a good girl. She learned her lessons, she obeyed. But if they were at recess, in the corridor or somewhere where adults couldn't see them, the girl could stand up for herself. Naomi, get away from me. A boy in the class swam at her. What are you gonna do to me? She'd come at him fearlessly. Look, don't take me out, please, he asked her. He realized that he was afraid himself, but he couldn't chicken out because the others were watching. All right, live. The girl was getting away from him. She couldn't wait for this school to end and normal life to begin. In Naomi's dreams, everything was rosy. She would get out of the orphanage. She would be given an apartment. She would meet a rich young man. He would ask her out on a date, give her flowers, say beautiful words. Then he would propose. They'll have a gorgeous wedding and the rest of their lives will be just as gorgeous. But things didn't quite work out the way the girl had planned. Yes, she graduated from the orphanage. At first she wanted to enroll, but then she changed her mind. She'll be fine without it. The state allocated Naomi a one-room apartment. Now she had a place to live, and she could do whatever she wanted. She didn't know why. Maybe because everything had been forbidden before. Now the girl wanted a lot of things. She got a job as a sales girl in an ordinary store to earn some income. That's where she met Steve. He came in every day after work and bought bread, 
cigarettes and cereals. Hello, Naoni answered him while making eyes at him. At some point, Steve realized it and came to her as a customer. Naomi, and give me the chocolate over there, he showed the girl. Sure, now she told him and took out what he asked for. When Steve had already paid, he smiled and put the candy bar back on the counter. This is for you, he said to her. What? It was an exclamation of both incomprehension and surprise at the same time. Why don't you eat chocolate? The young man was surprised. Why don't I eat? I do. But I thought you would come to me with flowers, she told him. Ah, so you knew I would come, he laughed. Well, why? I see how you look at me, Naomi told him. And how do I look at you? Steve wondered. As a girl, she got embarrassed. Do I look at other girls as boys? He laughed back. Come on. The girl was not timid because she could answer. Okay. Will you go out with me tonight? The young man asked her. Like what? She had her head down, and now she was looking at him sideways. I don't know. Like to the movies. Even though it was old-fashioned, Steve didn't know what else to suggest. All right, I'll go to the movies with you and see what kind of fruit you are, she told him and went on with her work. Steve came here from the country. When he went to work at the factory, he was immediately assigned a dormitory, and now he lived there. The young man came home, changed his clothes, and waited until seven o'clock in the evening. The store was closing at that time, and he could go and get Naomi from there, but he couldn't wait for the appointed time and went to the store early. Did you come? Naomi smiled. What are you smiling about? The guy asked her. What? You couldn't make it to seven, as if she read his mind. No, what's the big deal? He didn't understand. No, nothing. It's just my pleasure, Naomi said. Together, they closed the store and actually went to the movies. The show was only an hour later, so the young man suggested the girl to sit in the park. Do you want something? Steve asked her. Like what? She said her favorite word. Ice cream or a drink? He didn't know what to offer her. Well, of course you can, she said. Steve quickly went and bought everything and came back to the bench. The time was approaching. It was already necessary to go to the movie theater. So the young people headed there. On the way, both were silent because they could not find a topic for conversation. What was the movie, do you know? Naomi turned to the young man. I don't know, some kind of melodrama, he answered her. I don't like these snotty movies, she grumbled. So, what, we're not going? He stopped. No, let's go, let's go. We had to pass the time, so it didn't matter where to go or what to do. Naomi tried to say something to Steve. During the movie, she kept whispering in his ear, thus interfering with the picture. And when they left the theater, he sighed. Why are you sighing so heavily? She didn't understand. That went, that did not go to this movie, he answered her. Not understood, she stared at him. And what is not understandable, you all the movie was in my way to watch, as if with a claim he said to her. Oh, what a movie, calm down. She wrinkled her nose and moved forward on the sidewalk. Wait, Steve caught up with her. What, I'm in your way, Naomi was really hurt. Today he walked her home, she didn't even say goodbye walked into the entryway. At home, the girl berated herself for her pride, that she could never forgive anyone if they did something bad to her. But there was nothing she could do about it now. Hi. Steve walked into the store the next day as if nothing had happened. Look, Steve, I'm sorry about yesterday. I really can't control my emotions sometimes, Naomi told him. It's okay. It's okay. Maybe it's even my fault. I don't need this movie, I'll watch it again later, and anyway, why should I watch it again? He started to mumble something. Come visit me tonight, Naomi told him. Okay, he replied, feeling himself getting anxious, but he didn't understand why. In the evening the guy came to visit the girl, they sat, talked about something, drank tea, everything was fine. 
From that moment, the young people began to meet. Steve went to the store to pick her up. They went to her house, cooked something together, talked. Month after month went by like that. Naomi, marry me. Six months later, Steve said to her. And by will, she made big eyes and looked at him. Then they both laughed. What did I say that was so funny? The young man didn't understand why they were both laughing. No, nothing, you just asked as if I would disagree, she answered him. I feel really good with you, Steve hugged her. For some reason neither of them thought that there were no words of love in their pairing. They just felt good with each other. But at that moment, neither she nor he cared. They liked to be around each other. They kind of supported each other. Why don't we celebrate the wedding in the village? Steve suggested it. Ugh, I do not want in the village. Who will see me there? Grumbled the girl. And here who will see you? But there is no need to rent any restaurant, no canteen. We'll set the tables right on the street, invite all the neighbors. You know how much fun it'll be, he told her. What street? She was surprised. Do you mind? He didn't understand her questions. It's March. What kind of street is there? Everyone will freeze to death, Naomi laughed. What are you, dummy? If we apply now, we'll get a date in a month. And there, look, it's May and summer ahead, Steve laughed. Ah, well, then you can, realized that he meant Naomi. After that, the young people did apply. They were scheduled for May 20th. I don't want to get married in May, she looked at Steve. Why not? He didn't understand. Don't you know the omen that if you marry in May, you'll suffer all your life? She told him. Oh, it's all superstition. He waved his hand. And I said I don't want to marry in May. The girl stomped her foot. Well, when do you want? He looked at the woman who took their application. Let's do it in June, she suggested. Okay, let's see. If there are places for June, then I'll sign you up in June, said the woman calmly. And indeed, there was a free date, so they were scheduled for June. Well, are you happy now? They came out of the registry office, Steve asked her. Yes, she smiled and kissed him. Now I had to warn Steve's mother that they would be arriving at the end of May, and they would be getting everything ready for the wedding. What if she doesn't like me, said the bride-to-be. Come on, you know what my mum's policy is. Whoever her son chooses, she'll love, he told her. You sure she will? The girl doubted it very much. No need to doubt, everything will be fine, the young man told her. And already at the weekend they drove to the village where the young man was born and grew up. Where have you been so long? A woman was waiting for them at the gate. Mom, what are you doing? Steve was surprised. He had never seen his mother behave like that. Yes, I'm kidding, hello? I wanted your bride to not immediately relax, laughed the woman. Good afternoon, looked Nauni at her and thought they must be friends. Come in, I have everything ready, called them into the house by their mother. All was well, they told the woman what they had come up with. She listened, nodding her head, agreeing with almost everything. Will you stay? The woman looked at her son and future daughter-in-law. I guess you're like, Steve asked Naomi. I don't mind, she shrugged. Then we'll have a little meet and greet tonight. The woman smiled and headed out of the house. So, how do you like my mom? The young man asked the girl. I don't know, fine. I think she walked over to the window and watched Steve's mother chopping wood. What's in there? He asked. Maybe you can help, the girl turned to him. Now, why she did not say anything, went he went outside. In the evening, as promised Naomi invited neighbors with whom the family was close. A fire was built outside, after that Steve stacked bricks there, so that he could put skewers and grill a kebab. Even though it was chilly, everyone was talking and having fun here, no one wanted to go home. Well, Steve, Will you invite me to the wedding? A neighbor came up to him. You want, of course, because we will celebrate here. The guy told him cheerfully. Great, you won't regret it, he promised him. Steve could see how Naomi liked it here. 
she had never had any relatives, and now she was surrounded by people who treated her well. They had to leave back to the city in the morning, but they promised everyone that they would definitely come back again. Next weekend we'll come here again, Naomi said. Did you like it? Steve asked her. If I didn't like it, do you think I would want to come here again? She smiled. Okay, I hear you. He put his hand on her shoulder. Now they worked during the week. At the weekend they went to the village. There they discussed the upcoming celebration planning. Everything was going well. Time flew by very quickly. At the very beginning of the summer, Naomi asked Steve to bring his mother to town to help her choose a wedding dress. He only smiled, but fulfilled what the girl asked. Hi. A woman walked into the apartment where they lived. Hello. Naomi came out to her. Afterwards, they went shopping. They decided not to spend a lot and buy a simple dress. Everything was done. The wedding was a week away. The mother went to her place and the young people waited for the end of the week. As Steve had promised, the tables were set up in the yard. A lot of people came. It was fun. The young were happy. Now, Naomi had a real family. It couldn't help but make her happy. In the village, the husband and wife spent a few days and then went to their home. Life was falling into place, back to work and everything else. Not a week after the wedding, Naomi felt sick. Let's buy the test, Steve told his wife. Wait a bit, in case it's just that, a malaise, she told him in response. I can't, I want to know right now, yes or no, the young man said impatiently. Okay, if this doesn't stop in a couple days, I'll buy it myself, the girl promised. They both wanted and dreamed of a child, if only they knew what would begin when their wish was realized. Naomi bought a pregnancy test as promised. She had done everything since the morning. Two scarlet ones popped up on the narrow white strip. Naomi smiled and went over to Steve to make him happy. I am very happy that our family will have a continuation, he said and hugged his wife. Every day he went to work, and Naomi worked too, until it was time to go on maternity leave. Money was tight. Before, when it was just the two of them, it had been possible to scrimp. Now, Naomi needed vitamins and more. And what would happen when the baby came? That's what the girl was telling her husband. But it hasn't come yet. We'll think of something. He understood everything himself, so why poke his nose in it? Okay, think. Naomi's moods weren't what they used to be. One morning when they had just woken up, Naomi wanted to get out of bed, but there was a stabbing sensation in her lower abdomen that made her cringe. I realized when Steve saw the way his wife looked at him. He called an ambulance, which came quickly and took the girl to the hospital. After that, Naomi was in pain in the hospital for a few more hours. It was so painful that she will never forget that feeling. And finally, their baby girl, Kyra, was born. Steve arrived. He looked through the window at the baby and couldn't believe it was his little blood child. He just cried and thanked Naomi. And a few days later, they were discharged. Sit with her, I'm tired, my wife said. And she went and lay down on the sofa. And I just got home from work. He looked at her incomprehensibly. So, what? It's your baby too. Naomi closed her eyes. Okay. Steve didn't realize what his wife was doing at home. Dinner wasn't ready. The baby wasn't changed. He kept quiet, did everything. Almost all the time Steve was with Kara. He got up to her at night, rocked her, lulled her to sleep. Naomi was not in the mood all the time. And when the girl switched to artificial feeding, a mother stopped getting up at night. We should buy formula, Naomi told her husband in the morning as he was getting ready for work. I know, he said. Steve was struggling to stay on his feet. When his boss saw this, he called him in. Okay, Steve, you need to take a vacation, at least a short one, he told him. No, it's fine, he shook his head. I can see you're run out like a rag. You need to rest, the man insisted. And who will make the money? Looked the young man in the eyes of the boss. You can't make all the money, and what if something happens to you? He wouldn't look away. 
Okay, Steve realized himself, he needed to exhale. He went home and on his way to the store, buying everything his wife had asked him to buy. At home, he admitted that he had taken some time off because rest was necessary. What, and where are we going to get the money? Or do you think it's going to fall out of the sky on us? Naomi began to shout. Don't yell, the husband grumbled. Here's your child, feed him, put him to bed, read him a story. She shoved Kira in his hands as if he'd never done it before. Where are you going? He saw her start to get dressed. I'll take a walk, without turning around, she said. Good, Steve didn't argue, because he didn't want to argue, which was all Naomi had been doing lately. The girl realized that motherhood was not for her, and that she would not have any more children. She couldn't wait for Kira to go to kindergarten, so she could go to work. Now, while Steve was on a short vacation, she went out every day. Her husband didn't say anything to her. He would play with his daughter, then feed her, and they would go to bed together. He didn't understand what the big deal was. When it was time to go to kindergarten, Steve would get ready in the morning, get Kara started first, and then go to work. Naomi waited. She went to work. Now she could linger there while her husband and child were already home. Why are you always away? The husband asked his wife. Give me some freedom, she asked him. I've already given you everything, he told her. Yeah, thank you, the wife said with a kind of sarcasm and went to the kitchen. Steve was working. He was taking part-time jobs now to make a little more money, but they were all going somewhere. His daughter went to the first grade. Nothing changed in the family. Naomi kept working late. She could be sitting with the girls, celebrating something Steve didn't know. He wasn't really interested in it anymore. Kara, how are you doing at school? Dad asked the girl. Everything was fine. She was doing well because Steve had been studying with her before. You could tell the girl was even a little uninterested because she knew a lot of things. Steve knew his daughter was shy of her peers. She had clothes, but not many. Everything was clean, but a little one. Kara could walk around in the same thing for months at a time. It was the beginning of fourth grade, her last year of elementary school. Naomi was getting a little wild, she might not come home, and if her husband said something to her, she just let it go. A friend asked Steve to work a shift in the north. He agreed, but he needed time to think it over and talk to his wife. He came home, and there was Naomi, not alone, but with another man, both of them in such a state that he just wanted to spit and leave. We're getting a divorce, he came home that evening. What are you doing? Naomi didn't realize what had happened. Do you remember what you were doing here this afternoon? He asked her. Did you come? She realized her husband knew everything. Yes, he watched Kira sitting at the table and drawing something. The man realized he was leaving her alone with a mother like that, but there was nothing he could do. He wouldn't take the girl with him on the watch, but there was no choice. Either he would make money or... The next day, Steve collected all the documents. He went and wrote a petition for divorce, did not forget to specify that it can be done without their presence. When he got home, told everything to his wife, she didn't mind. Naomi didn't seem to care at all. Kara, here is my phone number. If something happens, then be sure to call. He put a piece of paper with numbers on the table in front of the girl. Daddy, will you pick me up? The girl looked at him. She loved him very much and didn't want him to leave. Everything will be all right. He kissed her on the top of her head. I love you, she hugged him. A few days later, Steve left. He knew he wasn't doing the right thing, but he had no other choice. When he had worked his first shift, he was offered a permanent job and was offered to stay here. Steve thought about it for a long time, but in the end, he decided to stay. Mom, I'm hungry, Kara approached Naomi. Go away, the woman waved her away. She was sitting in the kitchen, a bottle in front of her. Nothing was holding her back now that her husband was gone. When summer passed and Kara had to go to the ruler, she just couldn't find anything clean. 
The girl chose a less clean blouse and a dark skirt, braided. As she stood at the lineup, she saw that many students from her class just stepped away from her. Kyra, what's wrong? A friend they'd been friends with for a long time came up to her. Nothing. She couldn't tell anyone what was going on with her. Why are you like that? She kept up with her. That's it. The girl didn't want to talk to anyone. They came to class. Their class teacher was a young girl who had recently graduated from the institute. They got to know each other, and she let them go home. Kira wanted to study, and she was good at it, but not everyone supported it. The girl would come home, her mother would come home from work. Now there were other people coming home with her, mostly men. Kira would open the refrigerator, but there was nothing there. She would take bread, and sometimes she would eat nothing at all besides that. The girl tried to do laundry, but she wasn't very good at it. There used to be a washing machine in the house, but now it was gone. That day she came to school. By this time, no one was talking to Kira, and she didn't want to talk to anyone. They came to the lesson, which was just being taught by the class teacher. So, who learned the poem? She looked in the magazine. There was silence in the class. Everyone was afraid that he would be asked. The teacher looked up and saw that Kyra had raised her hand. All right, go to the blackboard, the girl grumbled. Kyra walked out. The class teacher looked her over from head to toe, surprised. Why do you stink like a bum? Do you live in a dumpster? She asked in front of the whole class, instead of leaving after class and talking. Kyra stood there. She looked at her classmates. They were laughing. She was so ashamed and offended that she just couldn't stand it. She cried, went to her desk, took her bag and ran out of the classroom. Kyra didn't know where to run, so she headed towards home. She opened the doors. A sour smell immediately hit her nose. She ignored it, ran into the bathroom, turned on the water, climbed in and began to pelt her body. It was very unpleasant that her teacher had said that to her right in front of everyone. What are you doing locked up in there? Naomi was banging on her. Mom, go away. The girl didn't want the woman to know anything. When all was quiet, Kyra came out of the bathroom. She saw her mother's cell phone lying on the nightstand in the hallway. The girl picked it up, dialed her father's number, but as usual, there were no funds on the balance. Why? She stared at the phone. At that moment, Kyra got the idea to look for another device in the pocket of one of the guests. She reached into one of the jackets and there was a phone. Now, as she entered the numbers, it buzzed. Daddy, hi. She heard a familiar voice. Kyra? The man was surprised. Yes, take me away from here, cried and screamed the girl. Tell me what happened. He was interested. Daddy, come, she begged, realizing that she could be hurt and scolded. Okay, I'll come in a few days, Steve promised. From that moment on, Kara waited for her father to arrive. She left the house every morning with her mom, but she didn't go to school. The girl didn't want to go home either. She just wandered the streets or sat under the stairs and could be there until the evening. Steve took a little vacation. He couldn't leave his daughter alone. He took tickets for the near future and went to pick up his baby girl. Two days on the road and there he was. Steve drove to an address he knew. You. He walked into the apartment. Who's there? He heard his wife's voice. She was in her usual state. What is this? I sent you money every month. What did you spend it on? He saw the state of the apartment. Daddy. His daughter ran out of the bathroom. She had spent a lot of time in there lately, like in a shelter. Hi, honey. He looked at the girl. She was very thin. Have you eaten anything? He asked her. Daddy, pick me up. She hugged him tightly. Steve could afford it now. He was working. He had rented an apartment, and he had somewhere to bring the baby. The man couldn't understand how this could happen, even though Nauni had been out and about, dating other men, but she wasn't like this. Naomi, I ask you to kick everyone out. We need to talk. He entered the kitchen. Fuck you. That's all his wife said to him. So, Kyra, 
get ready, everything for him. Steve wasn't sitting still. He was out at work, doing his best to earn money for all the equipment Kara needed. On one hand, he was excited, but on the other hand, it was scary what would come out of it all. Steve bought a computer, installed all the programs. Even though he didn't understand it himself, he hired specialists who did everything. Do you think I can do it? The girl asked him. Of course, he was sure, without ever showing his daughter that he himself doubted it very much. It took Kara a long time to master the programs at first. She had to learn almost everything herself. Her father was at work all day and came back in the evening. Of course, if Kyra didn't understand something, she put it off, waited for Steve, and then they worked it out together. This was new not only to the man and his daughter, but to many others as well, especially the custody and other services that had been watching the family for some time. Are you ready? The father asked his child's father when the English teacher was to come to take Kara's test. I don't know, and it was true because, except for her father, she hadn't talked to anyone for a long time. Okay, everything will be fine, I believe in you. The man always and in everything supported his girl. Even if she failed, he would still be on her side. There was a knock on the door. Steve went to open it. Hello. A pretty woman stood on the doorstep. Come in. After the greeting, the man invited her in. Anna entered, looking around. To be honest, she was also surprised that a healthy girl and homeschooled. Kara is over there. He showed her the direction. Thank you, she smiled. After that, she and the girl closed the doors to the room so that nothing would disturb them. The exam began. Steve was waiting for them in the kitchen, worried. You did well. He heard a woman's voice from the corridor, went there. So, what do you think? He began to ask questions. Everything is very good. Kyra is very good, praised the girl Anna. Before this, Steve had only communicated with her in correspondence and on the phone. Let me at least give you some tea. He led her into the kitchen. Thank you. She smiled. Well, tell me, what's with the knowledge of English? He poured boiling water into the cups. I could be wrong, of course, but if Kara had been at school, she would have had excellent results. Anna looked at Steve. I can't help it, and I won't let you traumatize the child again, the man said seriously. Traumatize? The teacher didn't understand. Yes, Steve looked out of the kitchen, saw that the daughter was not around, and then briefly told the guest what happened. So you should have gone to a counselor. She made surprised eyes. You see, I was not around then, and the mother could not, or did not want to, he sighed. Okay, it's clear to me. Can I come to you sometimes and study with the girl? She stood up, without taking a sip of tea. If Kara agrees and it's not too much trouble for you, then I won't prevent it in any way. Steve went into the room to get his daughter. He asked her what Anna had just suggested to him. Let her come. She couldn't say she liked the woman, but the fact that she didn't feel threatened by her was a fact. Yes, she didn't mind, was the man surprised. From that moment on, Anna became a frequent visitor to the house. She chatted with the girl, and in the evening, she and Steve drank tea and discussed what changes there were in her studies. She's very clever, Anna said. I know that, when he thought about it, he was ashamed and hurt. Steve felt guilty that this had happened to the girl, but there was no going back now, so he had to be supportive and helpful. Well, I see that you are a very good father, and you will do everything to make your daughter's future, smiled Anna. Are you coming tomorrow? Steve asked her. Do I have to? I wasn't going to. Her cheeks turned a little red. It would be a pleasure. Steve had long ago realized that he liked her and wouldn't mind starting a courtship. Just make sure you talk to Kara before you do. If she's against it, then definitely nothing will happen then. He'll wait. His daughter's feelings are more important. Well, if I have free time, I'll definitely come. She looked at the clock, stood up, and headed for the exit. I'll talk to my daughter. 
He spoke in a low voice so that for now Kyra wouldn't hear. Of course, Anna understood everything. She left, Steve closed the door and went to Kira. Do you like her? Without turning to her father, she asked her daughter. What makes you think that? At first, he wanted to pretend that he didn't understand anything at all. Dad, the girl turned to him. Okay, okay, well, sorry. I'm not iron. He spread his hands and sat down next to Kyra. If you're worried our mind, I don't. She walked over to him. Thank you. Her father nodded his head. Just don't let her pick on me. She'll never be a mother to me. Kyra wasn't looking at her dad now. Of course, Steve shook his head. At this point, he remembered about Naomi. Could you do that to your child? It had been so long, and she still hadn't called once. The next day was business as usual. In the morning, Steve went to work. Kyra stayed home. She woke up and immediately sat down at the computer, reading, doing, writing. Dad came home in the evening. He was carrying big bags. What did you buy there? His daughter came out to him. If Anna comes today, we'll make a feast. He put a cake on the table, different kinds of tea, as well as other products. And if she doesn't come, Kara looked into his eyes. Then the party will be just you and me. Steve looked at his daughter again. He wanted her to forget that period of her life, when something happened to her that made her a recluse and a sociopath. And for that to happen, he needed to show her that it wasn't that bad. After 7 o'clock p.m., the man didn't count on anything. He put the kettle on. There was a baked potato and chicken in the oven. On the table, Steve put a cake called Kara. Wow, where do you know how to do all this? Surprised daughter when she came. Life taught me, he said sadly. They just sat down at the table. As in the door knocked, father and daughter looked at each other. He smiled. I'll get it. Steve got up from the table. Kara didn't want anyone to intrude on their little world. She knew that her father wasn't doing well on his own. That's why she agreed to take this woman in. Kara, it's Anna, the girl heard from the hallway. Good, she replied. The teacher walked over, sat down at her desk. Her cheeks were red. You could see she was uncomfortable. Wow, just like Kira was surprised by the guest. Enough already, one or the other. It's just potatoes and chicken. Steve began to arrange the food on plates. The conversation didn't go well at first. Kira was silent, Anna was shy, and Steve didn't know what to talk about. Kyra, tell me, are you comfortable studying like this? Anna began, perhaps, she thought, this topic is interesting to everyone. Yes, the girl looked at the woman frightened as if she was going to force her to do something. If we meet more often, will you let me help you? Anna said calmly. I don't know, Kara shrugged, and it was true. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Anna didn't want their communication to start with consternation and misunderstanding. Okay, enough talk about all this, let's eat cake. Steve distracted everyone from the serious conversation. After the cake was eaten and the tea was drunk, Kyra got up and went to her room. Thanks for coming, Steve turned to Anna. It took me a long time to decide, but then I decided to give it a try, she blushed again. If it's true, I propose to make it a tradition, Steve laughed. What? The guest didn't understand. You're coming to visit us. He explained to her. Well, we'll see how it goes, Anna didn't mind. Then they sat for a long time, talking about various things. And in the evening, before leaving, she went to Kira. May I? She looked in on her. Yes, there was nothing else to do but say yes to Kara. Anna warped in. She wanted to talk to the girl, but she realized that if she started this conversation as a lecture or something like that, she just wouldn't listen to her. Are you really okay with your dad and I seeing each other once in a while? The teacher tried to make it sound as if Kara was the one who decided everything. She thought it might give the girl some confidence. And if I say no, Kyra looked at her. Then I'll ask you to let me come to your place like before, once a week, and study. Anna smiled. 
Okay, I can see that your father likes you. You can socialize, but don't come to me with empty questions and advice, Kyra asked. Then, until tomorrow, smiled Anna. She saw that the girl at her age reasoned and thought not like a child. I'll walk her out, Steve saw Anna putting on her shoes. Okay, she nodded slightly. When a few months had passed, Anna approached Kyra and asked permission to move in with them. Simple, Steve had suggested it to her, and she couldn't help but consult with the girl. I don't mind, in the months Steve has been in contact with Anna, the girl has seen that the woman treats her well. If she approaches her, it's for business, doesn't shake her rights, doesn't set conditions, and most importantly, doesn't force her to do anything she doesn't like. Thank you. Anna wanted to hug Kyra, but she pulled away. No, she realized it was a gesture of disrespect, but she didn't want to get close to anyone yet. She hadn't even hugged her father, even though she loved and respected him. I'm sorry, stepped Anna away from her. From that moment on, there was a woman in the house. Now every day they had delicious breakfasts, lunches and dinners. It wasn't as important as Anna and Kyra's classes. Daddy help, Kira asked him one day. Of course, he went to the technology. Look, I want to install this program, but I can't figure it out. The girl let him sit down. So, Steve, though not a computer ace, understood a little. I want to start drawing, his daughter told him. Now she was finishing eighth grade. The thought came into her head that she could try to earn money. How to start? Did not understand the father. He looked at the shelf, where there were stacks of albums and just drawings on paper. Graphically, Kyra explained to him. I see, father, as if he didn't even hear her. He was installing the program. Then he tried something, as if it worked, but it still had to be checked. Yeah, let me do it. She waited for her dad to get up to take his seat. Kyra sat down, took the fly, started doing something. Her dad left the room at that point to get out of her way. He and Anna were going out tonight. But while she was away, Steve decided to read about modern technology and digital art. I'm home. Anna came in the evening. Steve was ready by now. I need your help. He called her into the room for a moment. Today, while he was sorting through everything his daughter had asked him to do, he realized there was a lot of stuff in English. I see, we'll take a walk now, come back, and I'll help, she kissed her lover. They warned Kira that they were leaving for a few hours, then they went. The girl today all day sat uninterrupted at the computer. She did not even pay attention when the adults told her something. Why did you decide to do this? Anna asked Steve. What, studying? He guessed. Yes, she nodded. Kira asked today. He told her. And that's a great idea. Anna didn't finish. Go on, he waited. Now almost everything is done on technique. Yes, the classics are still there, but digital painting is also in demand. If you do it, you can even start making money. Anna shared her thoughts. Wow, he shook his head. If Kara needs help, I'll help her too, the woman promised. They took a walk, returned home, Kara still sitting at her computer. Anna walked into her, sitting down next to her. Steve told me everything. I approve of what you want to do, she told the girl. Thank you, but I can't do anything. She showed Anna some incomprehensible drawings. Nothing. Now I will help your father to understand, and then he will show and tell you everything, she promised. Thank you. Every day Kyra accepted Anna better and better. Have you prepared? You have an exam in a couple of days. Anna asked carefully. She was afraid to ask such questions. Oh, I completely forgot. I need help. Kyra got up from her chair and went to the closet where books and textbooks were lying. Yes, of course. Anna was very surprised. It was the first time Kara asked her for help herself. No one had ever offered her anything. After that, the girl took out textbooks, some notebooks, opened the curriculum, began to tell and show what she could not do. The woman looked at all this and smiled. 
Here, everything was on the table. Look, Anna turned on the teacher and began to tell the girl with simple examples, what and how. It's very easy, wondered Kyra, why she couldn't understand everything herself. Yes, when you understand, everything is very simple and easy, smiled Anna in response. After that, she told the girl what she had told Steve today. You could see Kyra's eyes light up. I did not think that sitting at home can earn something, surprised, and at the same time pleased, the girl. Believe me, if a person is purposeful and wants something, he will definitely succeed, said Anna. When she left the girl's room, Steve was waiting for her in the room. What were you doing there so long? He asked at once. Nothing, looking, taking it apart. Anna shrugged. She sat down next to him. Did you get it? He smiled and showed Anna what he was reading at that moment. I think so, she began to read. What do you think? He waited for Anna's response. Look, to get serious about this, one computer won't be enough. She looked up at him. Okay, say what you need, I'll buy everything. He was ready right now to take a sheet of paper and start writing. No, I'll get a handle on the subject within a few days, and then I'll tell you everything. She laughed that Steve was so fast. No one was doing anything anymore today. Kira continued to study. After Anna explained everything to her on her fingers, she passed the exam with a perfect score. The girl began to socialize with her more closely. Steve bought some modern equipment, adjusted it. Now Kara was better at drawing. At first, the girl was interested in some animated characters. She was very good at it. Kyra decided to show others her creativity. And let's buy a dog, then I'll just walk with it and breathe fresh air myself, said the girl. That's a great idea, Anna looked at Steve. Okay, then we'll go look for a dog right away, Steve agreed. Kyra agreed to that. She looked on the classified site to see who was selling the dog and where, told her dad, and they drove off. When they got home a couple hours later, Kyra had a best friend for the first time in her life. Have you thought of a name? Anna finished packing her bags. Yes, Rocky, nodded the girl. Great, smiled the one who now lived with them and became another close person for the girl. The next day, Steve and Anna left for 10 days. Kira wasn't left alone, and when she realized she had to go outside with the dog, she was scared. She was afraid to go out there without her parents. The girl went down to the first floor, let Rocky go. He barked loudly. And when he had done all his business, Kyra called him back home. She realized that she herself had offered to buy a dog, but now it was becoming a big problem for her. It was comfortable at home. Kyra continued with her activities. Drawings were being bought well. Many people were just leaving good comments, which couldn't have been more gratifying. Why don't I write something back? The girl asked herself. She opened the comments and began to reply to those who admired her work. The girl got so carried away that she did not notice how she began to write simply, already on a separate sheet. It turned out to be like a post history how it all started. Hello, she saw the private message. Good evening, she replied. The avatar had some kind of animal on it, so the girl didn't realize who was writing to her. I liked your writing so much, the person wrote. Thank you, Kyra smiled, she was very pleased. Maybe you could try writing something else, was the next message. I don't know, she realized that no one could see her, but she shrugged anyway. They talked some more. In the middle of talking, they met. The young guy's name was Sam. He was in high school, and he was always on the internet. And that evening, Kyra wrote her first paper. Of course, she didn't post it anywhere. She only showed it to Sam. You have talent. Don't bury it, Sam advised her. Oh, you say that too. She was embarrassed, even though they were on opposite sides of the monitors. Kyra herself doesn't know if Sam inspired her to do it, or if she wanted to do it herself, but the girl started not only drawing, but also writing. It was mostly fiction. Now it turned out that first the girl would make a drawing, 
and then she would come up with a text for it. She continued to communicate with the guy. It was pleasant for her. But when he asked where she lived and suggested we meet, she was scared of it. You know, let's do it some other time, she texted then. Okay, I won't rush you, he replied. Kara took Rocky outside. She was still afraid to go out. Then she figured out a way to make sure no one was in the yard. Kara started going out, either very early and then very late. She continued to write. She enjoyed it. You could even say it sucked her in. When her father and Anna came back, she called her dad into the room. What are you two whispering about? A woman came in. Look, Steve looked admiringly at the sheets he had in his hands. What are these? Anna saw that they were Kyra's drawings, but what it said, she didn't understand. Read when Kyra saw the woman start to read, she felt a little uneasy. Anna started reading, stepped back, and sat down in a chair. She didn't just run through the letters, she read to get the gist of it. Kyra, Anna, exclaimed afterward. Bad. She stared and waited for a grade. Come on, unusual, but... The woman stopped talking. What was interesting to the girl? It's beautiful. Could not find other words, Anna. After that, she left the room where she was. She did not return for a long time. Steve and Kara were sitting. She was telling how she met Sam. And you know how I went out with Rocky. She told him what she had come up with. I didn't think of that for some reason. He shook his head. It's okay. It's fine. The girl smiled. At that moment, Anna entered the room. Her eyes were glowing with happiness. What's wrong with you? Steve stood up and walked over to her. Kara, I made a deal. They are ready to buy what you write from you, she said excitedly. What? Who's buying? The girl didn't understand. I have acquaintances who need just such texts, and if they will also be with pictures, it is only a plus, waved her hands. I don't even know, Kyra shifted her gaze to her father. What's not to know, just like the ones with pictures, Steve told her. Well, Anna waited. Well, we can try, Kyra agreed. Do you have something now? Anna asked. Yes, Kyra opened the folder. Great, they are ready to take everything. Anna was happy, as if she was selling something of her own. Kyra sent all her art to the address they gave her. They promised to pay for it if she liked it. But the girl was in no hurry. It was important to her what the strangers had to say. She was a little afraid, because if they said it was bad, there's no telling what would happen. Are you worried? Her father came into her room. What's there to worry about if I can't have any influence now? She answered him. When her father left the room, Kyra decided to text Sam. Hi, she sent, and waited for a while. Sorry, I was in the bathroom, he replied when he came back. Listen, I got everything I've been writing and drawing today. She realized she was bragging, but she couldn't help but share. I congratulate you, he put a congratulatory smiley at the end. Thank you, she sent an emoticon blushing with embarrassment. Of course, the money promised was small, but still, it's already mine. She wrote some more. They chatted for a long time, and then Kyra sat down again to make something up. Her father saw that her daughter was very enthusiastic about it. He watched her and was happy. Another school year had come. It was the last one, because the girl firmly decided that she no longer wanted to get knowledge. Anna helped her with everything. She and Steve applied to the registry office. Kyra was happy for them. The only thing she asked was that they either just get married, then she would go with them, or celebrate somewhere without her. Okay, daughter, we're used to it, Steve laughed. I love you. The girl was smiling a lot lately. It couldn't help but please her parents. When it was necessary to prepare for exams, Anna was always there. She helped in everything, prompted. If the first time her work was bought for very little money, then now she received a decent amount. Now she had more than one customer. Everyone liked the girl's work. Kara, you're doing so well. Maybe you'll write a book. 
her father came to her one day. No way, I still have little experience and knowledge, she waved him away. Why, when I'm going to read, I read, he told her. Well, you don't compare yourself to everyone else, his daughter told him. In the evening, she texted Sam about it. She found it funny that she was already signed up to be a writer. School was behind her. She had passed all the exams. She had to go for her certificate. Anna accompanied her. For this, Kyra was very grateful to her. Now nothing distracted the girl from her work. She spent almost all her time at the computer. It was the same as before, but now she was also earning money. Kyra, hi. Sam texted her one day. Hello. She liked talking to him. How are you? He asked and waited for her to answer him. I'm fine. Why do you ask? She was curious. I don't know. I want to meet you so much. I can't even tell you how Sam wrote. I don't know. But I can't say yes yet. She denied him again. Too bad. There's a sad smiley face at the end. I'm sorry. But it's like this. She couldn't open up to him because she was afraid he'd think she was crazy. Did something happen to you? It's like he heard her thoughts. I can't tell you yet. She didn't write anything else. Would you like me to tell you about me? The young man asked. Yes. She never asked him because she thought that if he wanted to, he would tell her himself. I was born in a normal family. There was a mom and dad. He began to write and it turned out that he wrote his story for almost two pages. When little Sam went to school, he was very excited about it. Mom and dad next to him, and a first grader with a huge bouquet of flowers. Then he started studying, and he was good at it. Hey, Malik. The girls teased him, because he was very small. You're so small, he almost cried. After that, he'd go home. It was very hurtful but he couldn't complain to anyone because they would just make fun of him. All through elementary school, the kid never grew up. He stood at the end of the row in gym class, always the last one. When he had to do something, he couldn't because he wasn't strong enough or couldn't reach. Sam, get the apple. The girls laughed at him at the fifth grade line. He'd come home. Mommy, tell me why I'm so small, he asked the woman. Well, what can I do, it happens, she told him not to pay attention to these taunts. And when he was alone after that he cried. And when he was in the seventh grade, he fell in love. He saw a girl, and he liked her right away. Sam couldn't think of anything else but her. He started writing poems, started a small notebook where he drew hearts, addressed to her and wrote. What have you got there? The girls would ask him, wanting to tease him. Nothing, he hid everything from them. But one day, when he was in the cafeteria, they took out of his backpack that very notebook and began to recite poems aloud. The whole class laughed, holding their bellies. Why are you doing that? Then the girl who was the subject of all that poetry asked. When Sam returned to class, everyone told him he was a poet from God. He realized someone had been going through his backpack when he got home, he went up to his mom. I'm never going to that school again, he said. What are you doing? The woman looked at him. Nothing. He lowered his head and went to the other room. But the parents didn't understand how this could be. They did not even listen to their son, sent him to the next day to the educational institution, and that was it. And on the weekend, the same girl came to seek him. Hi, don't pay attention to them. Let's go to the disco together today she said to the guy. He was going all day, and in the evening, when he was waiting for her near the building of the House of Culture, he thought that he had not bought flowers for nothing. He could have asked his mom for money, she would have given it to him. Christina came then, she was two heads taller than the guy. She came over, smiled. Hi, he said quietly. Did you really think she'd go with you? At that moment the girls, Christina's friends, started coming out of the bushes. What? He looked at her. Ha ha ha, she laughed. How could you think I would look at you? He then cried right there in front of everyone. Since then, I couldn't wait for the whole learning process to be over, so I could get out of there and never come back and see them all again, 
he finished and wrote to Kira about it. Wow, Kira realized that her friend had opened up to her, even though it was not such a fun story and even shameful in some places, especially for Sam. I've been at home ever since. I've been studying remotely, and now I'm helping people, he said. Kyra smiled. She realized that their stories were very similar, and how could she have met him on the internet? Okay, I'll tell you. She answered him and started to tell her story. You see, what a good father you have, supported you at this moment, said the guy, when he read all that Kyra wrote. Yes, and I am very grateful to him for it. She put a crying emoticon at the end. Don't be sad. Write your phone number and I'll call you, Sam asked her. Kara sat staring at the monitor for a long time. She thought about whether to do it or not. Then, she thought that the number could always be changed, so she wrote the numbers. It wasn't a minute after that when her phone vibrated. Hello, she heard as she pressed the button. Hello again, hello. She heard how gentle his voice was. How are you doing? He didn't know what to talk about. He just wanted to hear from her. Better and better, she laughed, because they had already asked each other all this at the beginning of the correspondence. Got it. That's it. I have your number. You have mine. Call me. He disconnected. Okay. Already, Kara said simply. She was pleased to communicate with him, and she did not hide it, but to meet, thought it was too early for that. Why are you so quiet? Her father looked in quietly. Nothing. I'm writing, she replied. Good. Anna wants to talk to you, he said. Let her come, was not against the girl. The woman entered the room. Today, she had a long time to tune in, thinking how Kara would take what she wanted to say to her. But she had made up her mind, and now she asked Steve to prepare the ground. Kara, you listen to me first and then you will speak for or against," Anna said quickly. I'm listening, nodded the girl. I was thinking that maybe you should go somewhere else, Anna asked her. I don't know, to be honest, I don't feel like it. Kyra made a face that made it clear that Anna had started this conversation early. You just think about it, and if you do, I'll help you with everything, the woman said. In fact, Kyra had already thought about it but she could not choose where to go. There weren't many professions where they taught remotely. Okay, she promised her stepmother, and she immediately left her room. The girl continued to work. She was writing everything, making things up, in parallel communicating with Sam. Hi. At first she was shy to call him, but now she did it just for fun. Hello, darling, he was telling her. The guy was very happy about these calls, because it was possible to talk to the girl without hiding anything, although they had never met, but intuitively realized that they were very suitable for each other. Don't you think it was fate that brought us together? He often told her. Yes, I used to, she admitted. Kyra, why don't we get together? He'd start begging her again. Look, I don't know. Since that incident, I've been outdoors very little. I spend all my time at home at the computer. Here I have in study and work, and the rest of my life, the girl confessed to him. What are you telling me? I have exactly the same, he laughed in response. Well, and then how do we meet with you? If both of us do not leave the house, it was incomprehensible to her. Well, let's, you come to me to visit, he offered her a way out of the situation. No, you what? She was silent. Okay. Let me come to visit you then. He had another version of events. Okay, give me time to get used to the idea and maybe I'll invite you, she finally agreed. Okay, I won't rush you. After that they chatted about Carrie's drawings, about her texts. When she talked to the young man, he often gave her some advice or ideas. It was becoming a habit now. Every morning and every evening Kyra called him, they talked for two or three hours, but did not give up correspondence. There was also almost everything about work. Anna, can I talk to you? Kyra called the woman. Sure. Why do you ask? Come and talk. She didn't understand why she had to ask permission. Listen, some time ago I met a young man on social networks. 
Kara began to tell her. Wow, Anna was surprised. Yes, I'm shocked myself, but it's not about that now. Kyra smiled back at her. Well, come on, tell me I'm listening to you. Anna did not even suppose what the girl could tell her now. All this time we corresponded, and recently I gave him my phone number, and now we also call each other back, the girl confessed to her. It's great, Kyra, you need to communicate with people and not be afraid of them. Not everyone is like your teacher, said this Anna, and immediately remembered the story of Kyra. Well, how could a teacher, a teacher with education, to say such a child in front of the whole class? But now she didn't want to think or talk about it. She wanted to hear what her stepdaughter had to say. He's asked me to meet him many times, and I've turned him down every time, Kara admitted to her. Well, that's not surprising. If you told me now that he offered to meet you and you agreed to it, then I would be surprised, Anna smiled. Yes, I've already thought about it. So what do you want me to do? I didn't know what to do. So, and what are his conditions? I wanted to know about it first of all women. Since he also practically does not leave the house, he calls me to his place, but to him I definitely will not go. At this point, Kyra stopped talking. At first, she didn't want to go, because she had to go out, to move around, but now she thought that she would have to be there, maybe with his mom, and if she didn't like her, and if she said something. Kyra, why are you hanging around? Anna asked her. No, just thinking different things, she answered her. I see, so what's next? Her stepmother looked at her. I do not know. He suggests that I come to him, and I suggest that he came to me. But in front of you is something uncomfortable. Sat down, finally, the girl on a chair. Come on, what inconvenience can be? Invite him, let him come, we'll look with dad. Advise you something, said the woman. Okay. But I haven't decided that yet. Kara came to Anna, hugged her. Everything will be fine, I know it, her stepmother told her. They chatted some. More. Steve came home from work, but Kara asked Anna not to tell him anything yet. When two weeks had passed, Anna wrote Sam that she'd agreed to meet him and that he could come visit her, and at the end she gave his address. Had I waited for this, he wrote her back. That's it, Sam. Don't embarrass me. I've made it through a lot of choices, she answered him. Now it was necessary to tell her father everything, and Kira went again to ask Anna for help. She naturally agreed. She first told Steve everything herself, and then they came into Kira's room together. I told him everything, Anna went in first. What about you? Kira was interested in her father's opinion. You still ask? Yes, I am very happy for you. I am only for you to be happy and now, if the guy comes, no matter what he is, but if he treats you well, I will accept anyone," answered her parent. Kara was glad that she had gotten such a father. He never abandoned her in a difficult moment, always supported her, even when, perhaps, it was not necessary to do so, he still did so, so as not to traumatize the psyche of his daughter. The girl was waiting for Sam and was actually very worried. After his stories about how he had been teased at school, what he was like there, she thought she was going to have a short young man coming to see her. What he was like in appearance, she could only imagine that too. And since she had a very well-developed imagination, she imagined something incomprehensible. Now Kyra could not wait for the moment when the young man would come to her and meet her parents. And then she wondered, and that they would get acquainted, and what they would do next. And so the day came, Sam arrived. Kira was home alone at the time, her father was at work, Anna was somewhere else. There was a knock on the door, she knew it was him. She went to open it. When the girl got the lock and opened the door, in front of her stood a very handsome young man. He was taller than average, thin, blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Kara was even speechless for a few minutes, because this was not at all how she had imagined him. Hi, he looked at her, smiling. Sam, she asked him. Yeah, and you were expecting someone else. He took a step forward, but Kira stepped back at that moment. 
Wait, she put her hands out in front of her. Don't be afraid of me, I'm good, really, the guide replied. They walked to her room. Kara was very shy, so she started showing, telling him how she does things, what she does, what it takes. You know, I know roughly all of this, because I also develop different programs and install them on platforms. Maybe he was worried too. That's why he started about his work. By late afternoon, my father and Anna had returned. Kira introduced everyone to each other. Anna quickly went to the kitchen to set the table. You stay with your father. I'll go help. The girl looked at the young man. Sure, agreed Sam. At first, Steve looked at him. He wanted to understand what his daughter's friend was really like. But as soon as the guy spoke, everything became clear. He started to say something about computers, about programs, about their settings, also about components. Steve realized that this was really the man his Kira needed. Then they sat at the table, where many topics were brought up. In particular, Sam admired Steve for listening to his daughter and not putting her in school anymore. But she didn't quit, and her father supported her. The certificate was received. The next day Sam went home, and a week later he came to see them again. And when several months passed like that, at one point Anna talked to Kira, and they offered Sam to stay with them. Basically, I don't care where I work, he replied. I just have to go and get my computer, he said. No one was against it. The young man went to get his equipment. Now in the room at Kira stood two computers and various other components. The young people had no idea that when they met and started working together, it would be very easy. It was as if they complemented each other. If Kara couldn't write something, Sam would prompt her. If Sam couldn't do something, Kara would come to his aid. And when the girl turned 18, Sam told Steve he wanted to have a party. So are we going to do it at home or go to a restaurant? Steve, if no one is talking about a restaurant, let's not make young people nervous. Let's have a party at home, sit quietly in a family circle, she asked him. And so it was agreed. By evening, Sam's mother arrived. And during the feast, the guy proposed to Kara. Kyra, why don't you say something? Anna whispered to her. I don't even know. The girl had tears in her eyes. What is there not to know? Look how well you're doing. You just have the perfect tandem where you come to each other's rescue, Steve told her. Yes, it's true what they say. That happiness will find you even on the stove, said the mother of the future groom. So what's it gonna be? Sam was waiting for an answer. Okay, I agree. The girl blushed from head to toe. Now Steve was ready to die, but to make for his daughter such a wedding, which she would never forget. Does it have to be crowded? She'd seen the guest list Anna was putting together. Well, be patient, dear. Relatives and friends should be happy for you, she asked her. I don't think it's a good idea to have a wedding like this, with so many guests, Kyra said, and looked at Sam. We can't do what our parents don't want us to do, he answered her. And yours, you'd think they wouldn't. Anna looked at him as she prepared various jars, boxes, ribbons, and other things. The bride and groom applied to the registry office, and the guest list was already there. Now Steve needed to have a serious talk with his daughter. Sam, can you leave us alone? He asked the boy to leave the room. Sure, he agreed. Kara, this is a very serious topic. Are you going to invite your mother? He asked his daughter seriously. No, she immediately nodded without thinking about that answer. Are you sure about this? You will not blame me later, that it was me who forbade you to do so. Dad, calm down. Kyra came up and hugged him. Then everything is settled. The wedding will be near our house, in a small restaurant, he informed his daughter. Yes, in a small restaurant. Have you seen how many guests are invited? Kara laughed. She was resigned to the fact that she would have to be in front of so many people. But Sam had promised to hold her hand, and now no one would be able to tell her anything. The wedding went great. Kira practically never got up from her seat. She was with Sam the whole time, and the guests had been warned not to get very close to the bride, 
to congratulate from a distance. Well, you see how well you did, Steve told her later. And then with Sam they came home. They started working, they were paid good wages. Shouldn't we be looking for an apartment? She asked Sam. If you want, we can do it, he didn't mind. The husband and wife worked hard, and although they stayed at home, they had a very good income. Now, of course, they could not afford an apartment, but it was not difficult for them to get a mortgage. When Kara shared it with her father, he only approved and added that he could help them if things didn't work out. I think we'll make it work, his daughter told him then. I know that, the father smiled, alluding to what they had all endured, what the girl had gone through, and what she was doing now. The account had enough saved up, and now the young people were deciding what to do first, whether to go on vacation or to buy something. By the way, her husband had talked her into a vacation too. They could afford a lot of things, but they didn't need a lot of things. Also, Kyra was very afraid of getting pregnant. She thought the children were not for her, and every time she and Sam had anything, she used protection. Now that they lived in their own apartment, they had a car, they could go anywhere at any time. Worked from home, had a lot of free time too. I never thought I'd work from home, Kira often told Sam. Yes, all people are stereotypical. They think they have to sit somewhere in an office or be in a factory. And when someone asks you where you work, you have to answer. And if you say that at home, many people may not understand you. He supported his beloved in everything. Once Steve called his daughter and said that she needed to come to him urgently, or he would do it himself. There was time, so Kira agreed to do it. Sam, Dad's calling to come over, so if I'm not home tonight, you can go over there right away, she called him. Okay, I hear you, never forbid anything, and he didn't ask her. Kara went, she didn't even think about what her parent might say to her now. She walked into the apartment. Anna was bustling around in the kitchen. She poured tea into mugs, put some treats on the table. The woman was always ready to receive guests. Hi. Kara entered the kitchen. Rocky was fidgeting under her feet because he missed his mistress very much. Oh, Kyra, how glad I am that you came. She hugged her. They all sat down together at the table, drank tea, talked, shared their impressions and emotions. So, what did you want to ask me or say? Kara looked at her father. I do not know how you will take this information and in general what you will do. But I have to tell you this, he sighed deeply, lowered his head. Well, talk, I'm listening, did not understand the girl. What could have happened that her father cannot tell her about it? Naoni, your mother, she's dead, he said, placing emphasis on each word. Well, with her lifestyle, I shouldn't even be surprised, Kyra smorted and continued eating as if nothing had happened. You're not going to the funeral. My father asked another question. Do I have to? She looked up at him. I sent some money for the arrangements, and I think it would be worth it if you went. Forgive her. It will make you feel better, Anna advised her. Okay, I'll talk to Sam, and maybe we can go there together, Kyra promised. Then she turned the conversation around, telling her what she was working on now, what she was working on. Her parents were very proud of her. Why didn't you come to see your father? Kira asked Sam when she got home. I don't know. I just didn't feel like it. It's family time. It's all good, isn't it? He came over to her and gave her a hug. Everything, but not everything. Kara smiled at him. Tell me about it. The young man became curious. Kyra told him the whole conversation with her father. Do you think we should go or not? She asked him. I think it is necessary to go, after all she gave birth to you, and Anna said right, you need to ask her for forgiveness and forgive her, then it will really be easier on the soul. Her husband held her by the waist, not letting her go after she entered the apartment. Well then, get ready, we'll leave tomorrow morning, she told him. When they arrived the next day in the town where Kyra had been born and lived for several years, they went straight to the place where Naomi was to be taken from. 
I haven't been here in so many years, but I don't think anything has changed. They drove through the town, Kyra looking out the window. What do you think? Are they going to tear down the buildings, put up new ones or something? Sam grinned. He thought back to the city where he'd lived. They arrived at some kind of barracks. Kira was surprised that they'd lived in a normal apartment before, but she didn't care about that now. The woman was lying in a coffin. It was obvious that she was heavily make cute. It must have looked very bad. No one recognized Kara, because according to her assumptions, all friends, acquaintances and friends were new to her mother. She had no relatives, so no one knew the girl. At the cemetery, she came up to her, put her hand on her feet and apologized, and then said she forgave her for everything herself. When it was over, some went to the dining room, some didn't, but Kara asked Sam that they not do what everyone else was doing. So that's it, we're going back now. He didn't understand her. Well, why not? We can stay here for a few more days. Kyra suggested to him to get a room in a hotel and see what new things happened in the city. Today they rested, and for tomorrow, they went to the local park. They just wanted to walk around, have a good time. They saw there that a bookstore was opening. Oh, let's go please come over. Kira asked her husband. Of course we will, we're just having a vacation, he said as they got closer. It was interesting to see what and how things were going on there. Kyra saw many new books that she wanted to buy immediately to read later. Kyra. She heard her name and was very surprised. She turned around and there was a girl standing in front of her. Do we know each other? She asked her and for some reason she started to feel a kind of excitement inside again, something she hadn't felt for a long time because she had been working with a psychologist for a long time and everything seemed to be fine. Kara, it's me, Maddie. Remember, we were in the same class. I was sitting on the second desk. And now Kara realized where all this excitement was coming from. Hi, Maddie, she said, and wanted to get away from her. Wait, listen, where have you been all this time? Nobody's seen you anywhere. We have a high school reunion in two days. Come, it'll be interesting, the girl called out to her. I'm sorry, but no, she answered her. Come, Maddie urged her and insisted. Well, we will think about your proposal. Tell me where everything will take place and maybe we will come there. Sam put in his word because he saw that Kyra was getting worse. Maddie dictated everything. After that, they parted ways. I want to go to a hotel. Kyra said, or better yet, get out of this town altogether, she said quickly. Calm down, honey. Everything will be fine, Sam told her quietly. Let's go. They drove to the hotel where he talked her into going to this reunion night. You understand, I only left here because of them. She made me out in front of the whole class. I was so ashamed, and what, now to go so that they start mocking again? His wife told him. What are you talking about? Look at you, you're a successful copywriter. You have everything, apartment, car, husband. You have something to brag about. Unlike them, he wouldn't stop coaxing. Oh, Sam, I don't know. The girl shook her head from side to side. And I'm telling you, come on, don't be afraid of anything. I'll always be there for you, he called her. And at some point, Kyra gave up. She trusted her favorite man. On the appointed day, the first thing they did was to go to the store, buy a dress for her, and then, when the girl was ready, they called a cab and headed to the very restaurant where her classmates were meeting. We're a whole hour late, Kyra was saying in the car. It's okay. If that's how they wanted to see you, you'll make a sensation now, he answered her. And indeed, when they entered the restaurant, everyone immediately looked around. Some recognized Kira and some didn't. But Maddie, when she saw her, immediately stood up and told everyone who she was. The teacher who sat at the head of the table immediately got to her feet. It was the same young girl who had once insulted Kara. Hello, everyone Sam spoke up. Everyone started greeting them, asking what was going on. 
Kara was mostly silent. Sam was the only one talking. Wow, what a life you've had. Some were jealous, some were surprised, others didn't understand. At that moment, the same woman who had been the class teacher for many years came up to Sam and Kyra. Kyra, can I talk to you? She asked. Sure, replied the girl. I want one on one, let's go outside, she asked her. What do you mean, let's go outside? Sam said. What's the big deal? The woman looked at him. No, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that you insulted my wife in front of everyone, so please apologize in front of everyone. He realized what she wanted to talk to her about. Yes, Kyra, your husband is right. I want to apologize to you. I was young, stupid. I didn't understand what I was saying. The teacher tilted her head. No, thank you. If it hadn't been for you, all this wouldn't have happened to me, she said, and looked fondly at Sam. After that they sat for a while longer, then packed up and went home. Kara said goodbye to everyone, thinking that she would never see these people again. When they were already in the city, Kyra thought that she was afraid of getting pregnant for nothing. She stopped using protection, but she didn't tell Sam about it. Kira also decided to have not only a baby, but her new work, and let it be a book. She was afraid to even think about it, but now she really wanted it, and on top of that she was inspired. Did you make up your mind? Her husband came up to her as she sat at the table and worked. What? She looked up at him. To the book, he smiled. What made you think it would be a book? Kara was surprised. She hadn't said anything to anyone. My love, who do you want to fool? He leaned over and kissed her. The question was still hanging in the air. When you start to write a simple text, you do not make a plan and content. You draw first and then start writing. And now it's not like that at all. He told her what he noticed. Yes, you're right. I finally decided, but I don't know what will come out of it. She lowered her gaze because she began to feel shy about her ideas. Believe in yourself and everything will work out, her husband advised her. Thank you for your support, she said. That's it, I'm off, I'm not interrupting. He left the room where his wife was working. Thank you, she whispered after him. If before always Kyra wrote fiction, it was some unusual people, aliens or monsters, all that accompanied, what? Sam came running. Let's go, she points with her hand to the bag, which stands packed in the hallway. All right, all right, let's go. The husband gets excited. He left his wife at the hospital and drove home. He had to get there. At home, he printed out what his wife had written. After that, he had to wait until morning to take it to the editorial office. When he did, he was promised that they would call him in five days. I can't wait five days, at least three. He wanted it done before his wife was discharged. So soon, I don't know. The man shook his head. At least one copy, he begged. Okay, we'll try, promised Sam. The young husband ran off to do the next chores, stretching, cribbing, balloons, and all the rest. Steve joined his son-in-law. Anna at this moment was doing a general cleaning in the apartment of future parents. Beloved, you have a son, Kyra called and said in a very quiet voice. Beloved, I congratulate you, cried the newly minted father. Say hi to daddy, knew they were together now. After that, Sam called his mother, told her that she had become a grandmother. She cried, too. The whole family came to the discharge, and my mother-in-law was there. Flowers, kisses, balloons, congratulations, it was all there. Everything's good at home, too. I've got a surprise for you, Sam said two days later. The editorial still didn't make it. What was it? She thought it was another crib or a stroller. Let's go, waiting for his wife to get dressed. Sam, you're scaring me, she muttered. They went downstairs, got in the car, drove off. It was some kind of building that looked like a store. When the car stopped, Kyra saw her father and Anna. What are they doing here? The young mom asked. 
Patience, smiled Sam. He walked over to the window, which was covered with something, waited for more people to come over. Kara was surprised to see her teacher, who had once offended her, among the crowd. Dear guests, I want to present you a book by a rising writer, Kira. Sam spoke loudly. What? The girl's cheeks began to blaze. She was waiting for anything but this, because the text had not been proofread, and he had already written a book. At that moment, Sam pulled down the cloth that covered what was now behind the glass, which were books. He walked over to his wife and kissed her, congratulating her. Kyra, come out to the people, say a few words to them. He took his woman by the hand and led her out to the center. Thank you all for coming today. She was very shy, but at some point her eyes met with the woman to whom she owed it all. Speak, her husband whispered to her. I want to express my great gratitude to a young graduate of the Pedagogical Institute, who immediately after it came to school. She did not know how to communicate with children, could insult and humiliate in front of other children. Thanks to her ignorance, I now have the best husband, father in the world. And now a child, and this book. At this moment, Kyra smiled. It occurred to her that she now had not one child, but two. Afterwards, Sam led everyone inside the bookstore. There he set up a small buffet. Everyone was looking at the book, wondering what it said. Kyra, I already apologized to you. The same teacher came up to her. Why did you come? I forgave you, but I don't want to communicate, Kyra said and went away from her. I want to read your book because I'm curious about my impact, she almost shouted. Buy it at the register. Without looking back, Kyra told her. Now the girl realized she could do anything. She looked at the people, thought she wasn't afraid of them anymore. Calm him down, yelled a disgruntled lady on the train. The father's reply made the whole carload of. When Selena was just about to leave the house with her husband Harvey, someone rang the doorbell. She did not hurry to open the door, as she is in a hurry to visit family friends. Time is very short. She has to stop by to buy presents. It seemed that the unexpected guest was not going to leave. The calls became more insistent. Selena ran to the door, peered through the peephole and exclaimed loudly, Oh my God! She hurried to open the door. In front of her stood her son Mickey. Mom, I thought you weren't home. Come in son, why are you like this? You should have warned me. Your father and I almost went to visit. Casey, come on in. Mom, I'd like you to meet Casey, my wife. I told you about her. So we decided to surprise you and sign her ourselves. Mickey shocked his parents with his announcement. Selena thought for a moment, trying to remember when Mickey had talked about this Casey. He talked about a lot of girls, but Selena didn't remember much about Casey in particular. In front of her stood a short, full-figured girl with dyed hair and dark circles under her eyes. Selena wasn't particularly thrilled, but now was not the time to show it. Harvey, Harvey, look who's here. Selena escorted her son and her daughter-in-law into the living room. Harvey, who had already spent an hour in front of the mirror trying to tie his tie, was overjoyed to see his son. That's news. Mother, our son has a knack for surprises. If he'd been half an hour late, we'd have had to stand at the door until evening. How are you, my son? Welcome home. Harvey greeted his son warmly, then looked questioningly at Casey, who was a little embarrassed and said hello. It's Walker's anniversary today. My mother and I are going to see them. Are you coming with us, or are you going to stay home and rest? Harvey asked. No, Dad, you go and have fun, and we'll get some rest, at eh, Casey, said Mickey. Well, as you wish, the main thing is not to be bored here without us, said Selena and hurried her husband. As soon as the married couple left the apartment and the door closed behind them, Selena said to her husband, Have you seen, uh, what's going on? Who the hell is this Casey girl? He says he told me about her, and I don't remember anything, but I don't like that girl. She don't even look like Mickey. Look at him, he's handsome, handsome, well-mannered, and this girl doesn't impress me. Selena started to grumble. 
Mother, stop it. Mickey's a big boy. He can decide what he wants to do with his life. What's it to you and me? Let him live his life. Let him make his own choices. A girl's just a girl to me. I'm talking about you. Harvey said and laughed. As the celebration at Walker's was drawing to a close, a tipsy Harvey made a toast. It was a good holiday today. I want to continue it. You, Maria and Alexander, are celebrating 30 years of life together, and on the same day, we learn that a new cell of society has appeared in our circle. To be more precise, our Mickey brought a bride into the house. So in a week's time, we'll be expecting the same group of people at our house. Congratulations and wishes in honor of Maria and Alexander smoothly flowed to Selena and Harvey. The guests gladly accepted the proposal to celebrate the marriage of Mickey and Casey in a week in a small circle of friends. The next day, Selena's family had a closer encounter with Cassie. Selena kept trying to convince herself that her vague doubts about Casey's unworthiness of her son were just her usual maternal reaction. She'd asked a lot of questions of Casey and was convinced that she was a typical girl, not a bad character, and Harvey had reassured her. A week later, the family was ready to welcome guests to the restaurant. Family friends were toasting and presenting their gifts. Mickey sat quietly in the corner of the table accepting congratulations, while Casey was off and back again. As the event neared the halfway point, Selena noticed that Casey was becoming quite talkative, and after a while, she let go of controlling her behavior. Now she was bravely telling obscene jokes and drinking with her father-in-law's friends. When Selena tried to admonish her, Harvey gestured that it was okay. Young, let them have fun. So what if she had a little too much to drink amidst the excitement, said Harvey. Amidst the excitement, and Cindy and Natalie will be saying tomorrow that Mickey brought some alcoholic into the house, and they'll be right. A girl's got to know how to behave in public. I don't think anyone taught that girl how to behave in public, Selena hissed. When the guests were leaving, Casey couldn't stand on her own. Mickey tried to take her home as fast as he could but she resented him for some reason and made her own complaints. All of this was happening in front of her parents. Selena could barely contain her emotions. The next day, Selena got up early as usual to make breakfast for the whole family. She went to the refrigerator, clearly unable to say hello to her mother-in-law, opened the door, found nothing for her hangover, and closed it again with a clatter. Casey, is something wrong? Selena tried to break the uneasy silence. I don't feel well, where's the store around here? She asked, and Selena could smell the sharp odor of booze in her face. The store is in the courtyard, on the first floor of this house. Answered the mother-in-law, you should have known better, and it's not proper to get drunk in front of guests. She added, but Casey didn't hear these words, because she had already left the door of the apartment, leaving it open. A few minutes later, while the pancakes were frying, Selena watched from the kitchen window as Casey came out of the store with a bottle of beer in her hands, sat on a bench in the yard and smoked. As the next pancakes were being fried, she saw Harry, the neighbor's idle and drunken son, sit down next to Casey on the bench and they began to chat animatedly. At the same time, another family was facing the dilemma of a daughter-in-law. The Weasley Seven's son John recently finished his studies at a prestigious university and got a job right away as an executive. John's mother, Nallory, had long dreamed of his wedding, so she began to rush with renewed vigor to get her son engaged in his personal life. Her son had no problems with his personal life. John has been dating Julia for a long time. They know each other well and do not imagine their lives apart. Therefore, John, not thinking long, offered Julia to move in with him. He promised that soon they would go to his parents in his native land, he would introduce them to them, and at the same time, they would determine the date of the wedding. When John arrived home with Julia, Nunnery too, looked on with great bewilderment. John, what about Angelica? She loves you so much, she's been waiting for your attention for a long time. 
It's a fine family, decent people, and they'd known you since you were a child, said Mallory to John while Julia was in the kitchen. Mom, Angelica, and I are just friends. She's nice, she's beautiful, but nothing can happen between us. Julia and I have been dating for five years. I can't imagine my life without her. I'm sure you'll like her very soon too, John said. John, we're not the kind of people who can let our feelings get in the way of sentimentality. You should have realized that my father and I are in business for life, and it's going to be in your hands soon. For this system to work as it has in the past, we need reliable connections in the government. Your father has served his time in the civil service. He's about to retire, and he'll probably be replaced by Frank, Angelica's father. Close ties with that family would guarantee our position, of course, and your welfare above all. That's why Angelica is the best match for you. Mallory continued to insist. Mom, my well-being depends only on me. I've got a good education, I have a good job, and I can achieve everything without sacrificing my happiness. If you want Frank, then be friends with him directly, without sacrificing the fate of your children. I'm sure Angelica probably feels the same way, John said. Then Mallory went back into the kitchen and looked at Julia setting the table so diligently. That girl is a good-looking girl. She had definitely received a good upbringing from her parents. She knew how to behave in public. She was polite and caring. A little later, she decided to discuss it with her husband, Jacob. Jacob is a man with a lot of life experience and understanding of the realities of life. His many years of experience in leadership positions have helped him to become an insightful person. Jacob, you should talk to your son. Why feed a girl false hope? She's probably already fantasizing about marriage and a future with him. It's time to let her know that's not gonna happen. John has a purpose in life, and that purpose is to further our cause and he needs to do everything he can to fulfill that purpose, including getting close to Frank, Valentina said. What does he say? Jacob asked. What, what? He says he loves this Julia, that he's going to make a career for himself on his own so Frank, and I can find another way to keep in touch and other selfishness. He's young. He doesn't understand a lot of things in life. He doesn't know how to deal with reality. He won't listen to us anyway, Jacob said blankly. So if we don't stop him, he'll do whatever he wants because he's young. That's why I'm telling you to talk to him. Otherwise, I'll talk to Julia myself and things will be much tougher, said Mallory. Mother, don't you dare upset the young ones. Why would you do that? She's someone else's child too and I'll talk to my son. Jacob reassured her. The doorbell rang and Cecilia the Weasley Seven's youngest daughter, ran to open it. She looked through the peephole and shouted toward her parents, It's Lenka. Jacob and Mallory looked at each other in silence. Angelica will be surprised to see Julia so diligently setting the table in the kitchen. Angelica is Frank's only daughter. She and John went to the same daycare, went to the same school. She's always like John. Even after Angelica studied abroad for five years and returned, she still has warm feelings for John. Angelica, you're just in time. We're having a family dinner, Cecilia said and smiled enigmatically. Jacob, Mallory, hello. Dad says hi. Angelica was standing on the living room doorstep the next second, smiling her radiant smile. Hello, Angelica. Health to your parents, she heard back from John's parents. Thank you, Nallory. I heard that Oleshka came from the city. Angelica smiled enigmatically. Angelica, and I will sit on the balcony. Cecilia adequately assessed the situation and tried to take Angelica away to gently prepare her to meet the new member of the family. Angelica and Cecilia were like two sisters, so when John brought Julia to the house, Cecilia was immediately worried about Angelica she thoughtfully called Angelica and told her that John had arrived. Cecilia hurried to meet Angelica herself first, to bring her up to date with the news and prepare her before she met John. Angelica, how long have you been in touch with John? 
Cecilia asked. A long time ago, you might say. Lately, I hadn't been able to get in touch with him. Either he was busy, or he wasn't in the mood. I decided not to insist on communication. I decided to wait for him to come, and then I could communicate with him in person. Angelica said, not suspecting anything yet. Well, in that case, I can explain his behavior to you. He got a girlfriend. They decided to get married. He brought her to us. She's at our house now, Cecilia said. What did your parents say? Angelica asked. Mom's against it, of course. Dad hasn't spoken up yet. But believe me, his parents won't let him marry that girl. And John himself has only ever favored you. That girl from the village wanted a beautiful life and probably just turned his head, Cecilia said. But John's a grown man anyway. I wouldn't want to have a relationship with him, knowing that he intended to marry someone else. If he decides to choose her, so be it, Angelica said. Are you crazy? Don't be so naive. You realize that John is every girl's dream, and you're one of them. If you give up, there's a good chance you'll meet some strange man with strange intentions. These hunters for women's hearts are usually very skillful, will tell you about high feelings and selfless love. They themselves will only have in mind your money and connections. I can see that in John's girlfriend. She gets up bright and early every day and tries to please every member of our family. It's understandable that she has a lot of interests, and you're just gonna put your hands down and say, Whatever John decides, that's what happens. John can decide with this upstart, not with reality, Cecilia said. What do you suggest? Do you want me to fight for him? Angelica asked. Fighting or helping John make smart choices can be called many things, but you should consider that our whole family is on your side. Your whole family is on your side. Our parents and yours will only be happy about your marriage and you both benefit from it. You think, with those initial conditions, it's possible to try, don't you? Cecilia challenged Angelique. Angelica stared thoughtfully out the window and pondered Cecilia's words. Cecilia realized she was going in the right direction and continued her speech. This plan means you won't have to work too hard. I don't know how long John and his girlfriend will be here, but Mom and I will figure something out. All you have to do is wait for our signals and proceed as instructed. Our goal is to sow discord between John and this girl. And every time he feels bad about the conflict, you will appear as an understanding friend. We'll take it from there, Cecilia said in a business-like tone. Well, if you're willing to help me, I'm gonna try to compete for John. To be honest, I still like him. Hoping for his attention, I've rejected a lot of people. There must be some logic to it, right? Now Angelica was starting to convince herself. Julia had almost set the table in the kitchen and was waiting for her fianta's family, not realizing what events awaited her in her life with John. Jacob talked to John the next day, of course, but he made it clear that he had already decided to be with Julia and it was useless to dissuade him. As for the rationality of getting closer to Frank's family, John advised that it would be better to marry Cecilia to their wayward son, which, of course, Mallory and Jacob would never agree to. What parents would want to marry off their daughter to an unreliable young man? And is it acceptable to play with the fate of someone else's daughter, who has crystal clear intentions of starting a family and continuing the family lineage? This is a question not usually asked in the families of grooms. A few days later, Cecilia was sitting on the balcony of their huge mansion, looking at something on her phone while chatting with one of her friends. When she was done, she went down to the kitchen on the first floor. Here Julia was diligently preparing something for dinner. Oh, it smells so good. How lucky John is to have a wife. She's beautiful and caring, and she cooks deliciously. Cecilia said with a wide smile. Julia had no idea about the family arguments surrounding her marriage to John within the Weasley family. None of the family members had given any indication that she wasn't welcome here and they would soon begin to actively set about eliminating her. 
but she had taken Mallory's somewhat cold attitude as the norm. I've heard that mothers are often jealous of their sons of their daughters-in-law, yet she has had full ownership of her son for 27 years, and now I share that attention with her. Maybe she's not used to sharing her son with me yet, but that's okay, I'll find my way to her heart. She is the woman who gave birth to and raised the man of my dreams. I'll always show her the respect she deserves, no matter how she treats me. Julia thought to herself and set herself up for the best. Cecilia did not show her true attitude in any way. She treated Julia with the utmost courtesy and complimented her. When they were alone together, though, Cecilia was free to be sarcastic and caustic about Julia's background. She was the daughter of ordinary people, not of officials like John and Cecilia. But Julia's mother tried to raise her to be a decent person, so she judges everyone by herself. So when Cecilia allows you to make barbed remarks, Julia ignores them. In this way, she convinces herself that she holds the bar high in her behavior. This is a common misconception of many women, not considering the fact that others may perceive it as a weakness. I admire how divine your baked foods are. Cecilia gave Julia a fat dose of flattery. Yeah, I love working with pastry. This pie with curd and lemon. Do you want a slice? It's really hot off the presses. Julia was genuinely pleased at the attention. Ah, uh, no thanks. I don't eat sweets. All flour and sweets are poor people's food because they are low quality and cheap. And I advise you not to eat too much of it or you'll get fat like the village women, Cecilia said, and continued to look at Julia with a smirk. Julia was taken aback by this unexpected barb. While she was considering what to say to Cecilia, or whether she should answer at all, she asked, John, when's he coming? You didn't call him. No, she hasn't called. I think she'll be here soon. Julia said after Cecilia, who had already left the kitchen, all of Julia's euphoria over the flavorful pie had turned into an unpleasant residue. Cecilia's got a talent for it. To compliment and thereby emphasize one's belonging to the world of the chosen ones is still a skill. John arrived just in time for dinner. Cecilia met him at the entrance and held her smartphone screen up to his face. Look, this bracelet from a very famous brand just went on sale two weeks ago. My mum showed it to me, she really liked it. Let's give her a present and split the money and buy her this bracelet. What do you say? Cecilia asked her brother. What's the occasion? John asked. What do you need an excuse to make your mom feel good? Can't you just surprise her? How hard can it be? Cecilia began to subtly press her brother. Come on, surprise, surprise. How much is it? I'll give you the amount. You buy it yourself. Okay. Oh, okay. That'll be $500. Mine's ready, Cecilia said. John pulled out his cell phone, made a couple of clicks on the screen, and told his sister, I put it on your card. Don't forget to tell mom it's from both of us. I want to see her happy too. John said one last time. A couple of days later at dinner, Cecilia stood up and ceremoniously handed the branded bracelet to her mother. She was surprised at the unexpected gift, but the children convinced her that it was normal to make pleasant surprises without an occasion. Mallory accepted the children's gift with great joy. At the family dinner, Cecilia announced that Angelica was having a small party tonight and she was invited. Her parents didn't wait for Cecilia's request to let her go, but suggested that she go to Frank's house and join the party. Cecily emphasized that if it was late, she would stay there overnight. She repeated to each member of the family not to expect her for the night and to go to bed. At midnight, when all the family members were already fast asleep, Cecilia quietly opened all the doors of the house with her key and made her way to her mother's room on the chains. She knows very well where her mother keeps her precious jewelry. As one would expect, the newly gifted brand name bracelet was also in that place. Cecilia took the jewellery box and also on the chains made her way to the dressing room where Julia keeps her things. Then she also quietly closed all the doors behind her with her keys and went to continue the festivities. 
When Cecilia returned to her home in the morning, Mallory had already discovered the missing items and sat in confusion. When she saw Cecilia, she told her that she had lost the bracelet she had given her yesterday. Cecilia was not confused. Julia, have you seen mom's bracelet we gave her yesterday? Julia ran out of the kitchen where she was washing dishes and answered, No, I haven't. It's a shame, Mallory. Maybe you put it somewhere and forgot about it. Julia said, I vividly remember trying it on in front of the mirror in my powder room and putting it back in its box. I even remember I was going to wear it to work today and bragged to everyone that the kids gave it to me, Mallory said. Mom, let's take another good look in your room. How can anything be missing from the house if no one has touched it? Cecilia said and led her mother to the second floor. There Cecilia pretended to look for the lost bracelet for a while. The voice inside her told Julia that something dangerous was going on around her. She decided to push the unpleasant thoughts away and remembered to go to the supermarket and get some groceries. While her mother-in-law and her daughter were on the second floor, she took her bag from the dressing room and headed for the exit. Julia, wait! She was stopped by the imperious voice of Cecily, who was coming down from the second floor. I looked in my mom's room and it's really not there. It couldn't have disappeared into nowhere. It could have ended up in another woman's hands. I was out last night, mom was asleep, which means the other woman is you. Where is the bracelet? Cecilia asked threateningly. How could you think that about me? I didn't even touch the bracelet. Julia was even more confused. Cecilia said, then walked over to Julia, quickly grabbed her bag out of her hands and turned it upside down. The entire contents of the bag scattered to the floor. The bracelet box fell at Mallory's feet. July, stealing is wrong. If John finds out, he'll be very upset. You could just ask him to give you one too. Cecilia continued in an admonishing tone. This is some kind of mistake. This is a setup. I never even thought about stealing anything from Mallory. Julia only now realized how difficult it would be for her to prove her innocence to these people, and she was horrified. As Cecilia continued to talk, Julia sprinted out the door and headed for the bench outside. She immediately called and told John everything. He promised to take care of it tonight and asked her to wait for him. At that moment, Cecilia dialed Angelica's number to delight her with the news. Angelica, get ready. John and his girlfriend are going to have some serious problems tonight. You need to call and prove yourself a loyal friend. Make John want to spend the rest of the evening with you. Invite him out. He'll definitely go out tonight, Cecilia said and hung up. Mallory didn't pay much attention to who her daughter was whispering to on the balcony. She was completely immersed in her own emotions and only repeated to herself, that she knew this girl would not bring good to the family. In the evening, there was a real showdown. Julia cried, swearing by all the saints that she had touched nothing. Cecilia, on the other hand, was unwavering in her accusations. Mallory sided with her daughter. Only Jacob realized that there seemed to be two separate factions within the family, and one of them had declared war on the other today. John realized it too. So when Angelica called him and asked him to spend the evening together in a languid voice, he briefly rejected all her offers and turned to Julia. We need to talk in private. Mom will be late. You and Cecilia try to calm down and forget all the talk of the day, John said. He took Julia to the nearest cafe and they discussed what had happened for a long time. John drew the right conclusions and decided to act immediately. Meanwhile, Another family had their own dramas going on. Selena came home from work early so she could make dinner for the whole family. She already knows it's useless to ask her sister-in-law Cassie to do this. Even though she stays at home and doesn't work anywhere, Cassie will find a thousand excuses to dodge any housework. Opening the door with her key, she was surprised to see unfamiliar shoes in the passage. And from the kitchen came cheerful voices. She walked into the kitchen and saw the neighbor's son, Harry. 
As befitted Harry's usual lifestyle, there were cans of beer and some kind of snacks from bags on the table. What's going on here? Casey, did you bring him into the house? Selena asked. Hello, neighbor. I was just stopping by for tea. Peace out, Harry said, leaning back in his chair. Casey wasn't in the kitchen. She raised her voice from the living room. Yes, the neighbor from the stairwell came by to say hello. Casey rushed to explain everything to her mother-in-law. Okay, Harry, we're not being very hospitable here. You please go home, and Casey, and I have chores to do, Selena said. Everything is as the mistress says it will be. I'm leaving for sure. Ulek, you're great. Come over to my place too. We'll have a beer and play some dungeons, Harry said and walked slowly towards the exit. As soon as the door closed behind Suryoga, Selena took Casey by the elbow and said menacingly, Are you out of your mind? How many times have I seen you messing around with that bum in the yard? And I kept quiet, thinking you knew what you were doing. Why the hell are you bringing strange men into the house when my son isn't here? And why is it a neighbor? Didn't you think it's abnormal to bring an ex-con into the house? A convict? I didn't know that. Casey still didn't understand her mother-in-law's reaction. And he told me he was in the army on contract, she continued. Selena could smell the acrid odor of alcohol from Casey. Woe is me, woe is me. An educated, well-mannered son brought into the house of an obscure girl. She is here all the alcoholics from the neighborhood, and she drinks with them at the same time. Why do I have to go through this ordeal? Selena clutched her heart. So he's your neighbor, he asked to come to your house. How was I supposed to know he was a convict? Your son loves me, and you're just jealous. That's why you don't let us live in peace. I'll tell him everything, said Casey. She's always so brave when she's drunk. And she drank a lot, as Mickey's parents had noticed. By this time, Selena had already dialed her husband's number and was telling him what she thought about Casey for the umpteenth time. Harvey seemed to want to avoid quarrels in the family as always and tried to calm down his wife. She couldn't stand it and almost became hysterical. She carries our grandson in her belly, drinks alcohol every single day, and is always hanging out with our neighbors. Now I have big doubts whether our grandson is in her belly. Talk to my son and tell him to deal with her immediately. Otherwise, I'll have to kick her out of the door myself. Casey heard those words and got turned on too. Oh, so you did tell me that we got married in wedlock. I knew it was a red flag to any mother-in-law. She mumbled to herself and dialed Mickey's number. But that was just one episode in the life of Mickey's family. Ever since Casey arrived in the house, scandals have become a regular occurrence. He and his father barely have time to calm their women down. Mickey realized that Casey really doesn't show herself as a woman. She can't cook. She's not used to keeping her house clean. She doesn't want to work anywhere because she thinks that everyone is cheating and underpaying her. He found out about all this too late. By that time, Casey was already pregnant and demanded from Mickey to take responsibility for her and for the future child. Mickey, like a decent man, agreed to all of Casey's demands. Selena, on the other hand, couldn't accept it. She hoped to see an educated and well-mannered girl as her son's life partner. Well, at least a girl without bad habits and without the tendency to start conversations with every man in the yard. But where to go now, when soon a grandson or granddaughter will be born? Selena only prayed that a healthy child would be born. Unfortunately, Casey's lifestyle didn't predispose her to that. No matter how much Selena talks about the harmfulness of beer, energy drinks, and quick snacks from bags, Casey immediately complains to Mickey that her mother is jealous and does not give her life. After the incident with the missing bracelet, John talks to his father and makes the right decision. He and Julia are not going to live peacefully in the same house with Cecilia and his mother. John rented an apartment and moved Julia there. The wedding was also decided not to postpone for later. However, both were very worried 
because the opponents of this wing turned out to be enough, and it is not known what they can still throw out on this day. The news that John and Julia had planned a wedding for next month puzzled Cecilia and Angelica. Angelica was sure that Cecilia would definitely think of something to keep the wedding from happening. But when they heard the date of the wedding, they decided not to give up. There was still plenty of time. If they couldn't upset the wedding, they could organize something special right on the day of the wedding so that the marriage wouldn't last long. This idea encouraged Cecilia and she decided to go ahead. John and Julia decided to hold the wedding modestly and for a small circle of the closest people. They booked a restaurant and distributed invitations to all the guests. On the appointed day, Julia excitedly prepared for the most important event in her life. Her parents arrived in advance, but John's parents didn't want to meet and get to know them beforehand. I'll see you at the wedding. I don't have time for you now. Mallory replied briefly to the introduction. John and Julia didn't pay much attention to the relationship between their parents that wasn't working out and were looking forward to the best. Angelica and Cecilia had bought fancy dresses for the occasion, but that was not all their preparations. The main surprise required more preparation and more effort. They even had to pay for it. They did not stand for the price. The long-awaited day came. The wedding was in full swing. The guests made toasts, congratulated the newlyweds and had fun. The parents did not particularly seek each other's company and each of them sat in the circle of their loved ones. As the evening approached its midpoint, Cecilia stepped out to make sure her plan was ready. After a long musical intermission, the guests went to their tables. An unfamiliar beautiful girl entered the room and drew the attention of all the guests to herself. Because she was wearing a wedding dress, the guests thought for a moment that they were imagining it. But Julia was still sitting next to John, and it was some other bride. John, on the other hand, turned white when he saw the girl in the wedding dress. The stranger in the wedding dress discreetly took the microphone from the Toastmaster's table and began her prepared speech. John, you're probably wondering why I'm wearing a wedding dress today. I think you remember the date exactly four years ago today. Long before that day, you told me that you dreamed of seeing me next to you in a white dress. Then you and I decided to realize our dream and secretly got married. The guests sobered up instantly and began to murmur among themselves. The parents looked at the girl with the microphone and John in total confusion. John stood there like a stumbling block, unable to think or say anything. At that moment, a video about the love story of John and this mysterious girl in a wedding dress started on the huge screen in the restaurant's festive hall. Yes, indeed, in the frames John shines in the image of a happy groom who is languidly waiting to meet his bride with a bouquet in his hands. In the next shots, this strange girdle is spinning at the mirror and puts the finishing touches on the image of the bride. The beautiful shots are accompanied by a romantic song. The girdle asked for the audience's attention and continued her speech. And there you walked away, leaving me and my daughter. You betrayed our love, but I decided never to betray it. That's why I still wear my wedding ring. The girl raised her right hand and showed her ring finger with her wedding ring to the audience. She then continued her speech. You told me that fate may separate us, but you will always live in my heart as my first and only love. I decided to live the rest of my life by those words. That's why I tell our daughter that daddy will come back to the family someday and we will be happy again, as we were on this day exactly four years ago. John. I see now that you have decided to start a new page in your life. However long your marriage to Julia lasts, may it be a happy one. But I know for a fact that you and I will be together again. I believe that our daughter you will definitely not leave without attention and affection. The girl continued to say. The bewildered Toastmaster stood next to the girl and persuaded her to give up the microphone. But the girl deftly dodged him and walked around the hall. He finally caught up with her and almost forcibly turned off the microphone. The girl finally shouted something in the direction of the newlyweds and left the room. But the love story continued on the screen. 
Julia almost fainted from what she had seen and heard. Accompanied by her friend, she went to the lady's room, barely restraining her tears and emotions. The festive mood of the guests vanished in an instant. Jacob, who was almost impossible to get out of his mind, shook his head and sat with his hands over his face. Julia's parents started looking for their daughter to comfort her. They were even ready to take her away from here forever if she wanted to. John's friends said something indignant to him, but he heard nothing. In his head, there was only one thought, to take the microphone from the Toastmaster and all the guests to say the names of those who came up with this cynical number. But it was too late. The guests got into several groups and hurriedly left the hall to give time to the heroes of today to sort out among themselves. Who knows, maybe the showdown would result in the wedding being cancelled. John got up from his seat and headed after Julia. He found her in the ladies' room. John was sure she was probably sobbing or hysterical by now, but it seemed he still underestimated her. John, do you know this girl? Julia asked. She was a little dejected, but she was in control and seemed to understand where the wind was coming from. This is the first time I've ever seen her. In fact, I don't understand what kind of show this is. I've never dressed up as a groom before, and this is the first time I've ever done it, believe me. It's some kind of a setup, and I'll take care of it. It's only a matter of two minutes, said John. Yes, I'd like to believe that version too. But how do we save the situation? Julia asked. The only people left in the audience are parents and friends. We'll continue with them. I'll take the microphone myself now and comment briefly. And that's it, John said. Everyone's mood was ruined. Only Angelica and Cecilia were sitting in the car in the restaurant parking lot, waiting with great curiosity to see how Julia would behave next. At that moment, someone knocked on the window of their car. Cecilia saw a hired actress from a local club who had played the role of the jilted bride brilliantly. She was waiting for the rest of her fee. The guests were so dumbfounded by what was happening that no one even paid attention to the fact that the strange bride, leaving the restaurant, got into the car of the acting troupe with large inscriptions and logo. She during this time managed to calmly change her clothes, disband her hair and put on glasses so that no one even accidentally did not recognize her. The actress took the money, gave her accomplices their shares in the car, and the troupe left. I'd never dreamed of such a weird wedding, Julia said, finally reaching the apartment. I'll start looking into who's behind this tomorrow. I think the event organizers and maybe the restaurant staff are involved. They're not going to get away with this, John said. Yes, this is a case where exposure is a must, Julia added. What did your parents say? They're the most embarrassed of all. And mine didn't give them a very warm welcome, John said. Well, my mom is aware that I have become the classic unloved daughter-in-law to my mother-in-law. I warned them that there might be all sorts of surprises. But I don't think they were ready for just such a surprise. Julia even smiled a little. John looked at her smile and felt immense gratitude for her trust and faith in him. It was only Julia's calmness and judgment that had saved the day. Although she had lost her temper at first, she was able to pull herself together quickly and not let the insidious plans of her detractors come to fruition. After the wedding, Angelica and Cecilia waited several days for news from the newlyweds. But there was no news. Angelica realized that it was pointless to keep fighting for John. Only Cecilia was not going to give up. She had a good reason. Cecilia works as a financial director for her mother. Mallory is about to take a well-deserved vacation. Of course, she's grooming her daughter to take her place. But for Mallory's business to continue to thrive from steady government contracts, someone in the family is bound to be in a position of power. Jacob, who has served as first deputy governor for more than 20 years, is about to take a well-deserved vacation. And that could mean the state contracts could go away and Mallory's firm could go out of business. Frakes had his eye on the job for a long time, and he's made no secret of it, and Jacob sees him as a worthy heir to his chair. 
In order for the scheme to continue to feed all those who have long been accustomed to the trough, there must be a very close cohesion between these people. Cecilia understood this very well. Therefore, she spared no money, time and energy to get rid of Julia and set up her brother John with the only daughter of Frank's family. But Julia turned out to be a tough nut to crack. During the next week after the wedding, John had no trouble figuring out how the strange girl got into the restaurant and how she got the dubious love story video broadcast. The restaurant staff, under pressure from John's friends in law enforcement, quickly admitted that some people came and made their own changes to the wedding program. They did not elaborate on what the specific changes were. That was their mistake. And none of them knew the actress. John found that actress through social media. When she was brought to the police station, she refused to talk. While the police officers were trying to get some information, they got a call from above asking them to release the actress immediately. John was pleased with the fact that it was possible to prove to everyone that it was an order number. And the identities of the people who invented and ordered all this noise were no longer so important. What I'll find out, they'll tell me it's my own sister Cecilia and her friend Angelica, maybe even my mother knows. Who's going to feel better? I'd already know they're always plotting against Julia and our marriage. In time they will get tired of it and stop these cheap tricks. John explained his version to his friends. The friends did not insist on continuing the investigation. They were more worried about Julia and her reaction. When John told them that she was very calm and reasonable, the friends were very surprised and noted that John had really met a worthy woman. John himself knew this and now he was quietly proud of it. Since the birth of her grandson Frederick, Selena has been forced to live on two homes. Between family and business, she makes sure to find time to drop in on Casey and Mickey. Casey continues to resent this, believing that mother-in-law interferes in her life. In fact, Casey has, as one might assume, become a worthless mother. She has absolutely no maternal feelings for her child. She is still drawn to the streets, where she can drink with someone or just disappear for long periods of time. That's when the child is left alone. Selena hopes to get her grandson into a kindergarten soon, and then she will feel better for him. But for now, the kindergarten refuses to accept him, as little Frederick is severely delayed in development. Today, Selena decided to visit her son's family again. She opened the door with her key. In the hallway, she saw the shoes of little Frederick and realized that the child was home alone again. The first thing she did was look in the children's room. Frederick is not here, and it is not by chance. He doesn't like to sit here. Usually, little Frederick likes to mess around either in the bathroom or in the kitchen. Selena hurried into the kitchen. The kitchen door was closed for some reason. Selena opened it, and at the same moment, her heart leaked into her heels. In front of the open windows of the kitchen balcony stands Frederick's plastic toy table, and on the table is his stool. Frederick himself stands on this stool and almost jumps out of the window, trying to scare away the pigeons that are crowding the window. See her grandson in such a precarious position, Celine cried out his name. Frederick turned around and saw his grandmother running toward him. The child thought it was just a normal game. Many children think if someone is running towards them, they will catch up soon, hence the need to run. As Selena covered the distance between the kitchen door and the window in a few steps, Frederick managed to sneak onto the windowsill. He wasn't looking into the abyss where he wanted to take a step. He was looking at his day's grandmother and he was indescribably amused by it. Frederick was saved from the last fatal step by the deft movement of the grandmother when she was able to grasp Frederick with both hands. Selena lifted her grandson off the windowsill and carried him into the living room. Little Frederick still didn't understand what could have happened and continued to laugh, considering himself in the game. She dialed Casey's number. The latter didn't answer right away. As soon as Casey picked up, Selena almost shouted at her, Where the hell are you? 
What kind of mother are you? A child almost fell out of the window. Selena, who asked you to come to us anytime you want? I can manage my child just fine without your help. I just went to the store for a few minutes, Casey said. Casey seems to be completely incapable of understanding the meaning of words and the consequences of various rash actions. Selena realized that a long time ago, and she's been trying to get it out to Mickey. But what's the use? By the way, does Mickey even know what's going on in the house while he's away? She dialed Mickey's number and told him what tragedy had been avoided a few minutes ago. Mickey, this isn't a joke anymore. Your Casey's not likely to ever grow up and realize her responsibilities in life. But we're risking Frederick's safety and his life for her. Please don't ruin your life with her. Try to get rid of her. I can raise my grandson myself. It's better for him. And at least you'll have a chance to meet a decent woman, Selena said. She didn't notice that by then Casey was already in the apartment and had overheard the whole conversation. As soon as Selena hung up the phone, Casey burst into the living room and tried to snatch Frederick out of her grandmother's arms. As she did so, she was loudly resentful. You still haven't gotten over your jealousy. You're even willing to divorce Mickey and me over it. You've been giving us a hard time since the beginning. We separated from you to save our family, but you keep interfering with it even from a distance, Casey said. Otherwise, you'd still want to drink with the first man you meet, loiter and parasitize my son. You're hiding behind my son to continue your promiscuous lifestyle. You can't even realize that by doing so, you are sacrificing your child. Selena once again tries to get through to Casey, but in vain. There were many such conversations and incidents in this family's life, but they were useless to Casey. This time, after Selena threatened to take Frederick back to her place, Casey was afraid that she might push Mickey toward divorce. Without thinking long, she made a decision that would help keep Mickey in her life. A couple of months later, she was able to successfully implement her plan. The pregnancy test showed two stripes. Casey was confident that Mickey would not abandon a pregnant woman and then a woman with two children, and Selena would hardly dare to take on the responsibility of two small children at once at her advanced age. Casey was delighted with her resourceful decision and looked forward to the birth of her second baby girl. However, Nothing had changed in her lifestyle. Parallel to these events, there were also changes in John's life with Julia. After the unpleasant surprise at the wedding, they didn't communicate with John's loved ones for a long time. During this time, they learned from the news that Jacob Wesley had left his post and Frank had taken his place. Surely, the question of removing Julia from John's life had become even more pressing for this family. But John and Julia decided to arrange their lives as they saw fit. John successfully built his career, succeeding at every step he took. Julia also worked until the birth of their daughter, Eva. Eva is now three years old. She makes her parents happy every minute and gives them endless happiness. Julia was thinking about going back to work these days. John was against it. Julia. I don't want our Eva to have the stress of adjusting to daycare. She's such a homebody. In a couple of years, she'll want to be around other kids. Then you can think about work. Right now, I'm still willing to work day and night so that you and your daughter don't need anything, Joan said. But I'm already bored sitting at home. Julia stretched lazily. Carrying a child under your heart, giving birth to it and raising it is a huge labor. It's just something society has come to take for granted. I don't want to be so consumeristic with you. You need to rest and recuperate. And then you can think about work. If you think it would be good for you, John said. Such words sounded very convincing to Julia. She continued to enjoy motherhood and lovingly cared for Eva. It was a pity, though, that Eva had not yet been seen by her grandparents. They would have loved her for sure and maybe they could forget old conflicts and finally recognize Julia's right to be near John. One cozy family evening, John called to say he wasn't expected for dinner tonight. 
This has happened to him often since he became an executive. Julia is very understanding. If she can't make it in time for dinner, she'll come back later. She and her daughter have a great time and are not affected by John's busy schedule. After a while, John said that soon there will be a corporate party in the company and everyone should come with their other halves. Julia happily agreed, as she had not known any of John's colleagues until then. John's team turned out to be really united and cheerful. The guests were having fun, singing and dancing. At some point, Julia decided to go to the ladies' room. She had not noticed until then that some of the guests had been watching her closely since the beginning of the evening, waiting for a more private moment with her. Following Julia out of the room was this mysterious man. As Julia stood in front of the restroom mirror fixing her hair, the mystery man dared to approach her, and it was a woman, a woman of great beauty, statuesque and haughty. Hi, what's your name? The lady asked. I'm Julia. My spouse works in this company as a CFO, Julia said proudly. I know him, the lady smiled enigmatically. The lady didn't say anything else and just watched Julia's every move with a smile. If at first, she had thought that one of John's colleagues had decided to meet her just for the sake of politeness. Now she was a little confused. The lady seemed to be following her purposefully. How long have you and John been together? The lady asked. Five years in total, four of which we've been married. We have a wonderful daughter. Julia tried not to give away her doubts and keep her composure. A little early, said the lady and smiled even wider. What's a little early? Julia asked. It's a little early for him to start cheating on you, honey. Maybe it's for the best and it'll be easier for you to find your man. She began to fix her hair thoughtfully. What are you trying to say? It's okay. John loves me. I love him too. You gave birth to a daughter. I can give him a son. Just keep that in mind. The sooner you realize that I'll win, the easier it will be for you, the lady said, looking straight into Julia's eyes. Julia had an immediate sense of deja vu. Throughout her life with John, how many times had she heard such threats? She couldn't count them all. As a rule, it was usually someone close to John who was behind them. Julia was glad that this time she hadn't given in to her emotions and had figured out what was going on almost immediately. On the way home, John asked about Julia's impressions of his co-workers. She shared all the positive aspects of the evening, but a strange lady came up to me and tried to tell on you. But I'm an old timer, and I know that intrigue against our family can be found anywhere, so I didn't argue with the lady. And by the way, I didn't even ask her name, Julia said, looking at her husband. John didn't comment on this, but drove on in silence. It was as if a whirlwind of emotion had started inside him, and he was trying to hide it carefully. Julia thought that John, too, had long since had enough of these cheap tricks, and that was why he was reacting in such a way. At this point, this incident was forgotten. After the birth of the second child, Casey was much less worried about her marriage to Mickey. Her position in the family is now stronger. Mickey loves his son and daughter very much. For their sake, he is ready to do anything. If Selena does not constantly interfere, as it seems to Casey, then Mickey is simply an ideal husband. Yeah, but for Casey, it was completely unexpected when Mickey once poured a flood of emotions on her. Casey, a mother of two can't be so careless. How many times can you leave your kids alone? and got out with questionable friends. Who are these friends of yours? They're basically backyard drunks and bums. Do you really think you're on the same level as them? Everything has to be in moderation. I can't take endless days off work to take care of the kids. You need to rethink your lifestyle and get smart, said Mickey. Casey was even more confused. So she thought Mickey was on her side, but somehow Selena had swayed him to her side. It looked like her mother-in-law was getting serious about her now. That's what she thought and took all the objective criticism she got. After a while, she really decided to change and become a responsible mother. 
In her mind, it looked like a working and earning woman. She decided to make a surprise for Mickey. She got a job as a sauna administrator, and Mickey informed her about it only on the eve of the first working day. But Mickey surprised her again with his reaction. Casey, you don't need to work and make money. I'm doing just fine. You just take good care of the children and don't think about money and work while they are little. When they grow up and become more independent, then please work for your own pleasure, Mickey said. Casey was very upset. She felt like she was being picked on for nothing. Everything she did was wrong, and everything was wrong. She remembered some advice from a fashion magazine that a woman should never give up on her goals, no matter what a man told her. So she decided not to give in to Mickey and go to work. Working in a sauna meant socializing with different people. However, those who wanted to socialize in the sauna often turned out to be drunk people. And these conversations are very specific. Young lady, you're so beautiful, but you're so sad. Did someone hurt you? On Casey's first day at work, there was a kind person at work who was ready to listen to her and feel sorry for her. Casey, out of the goodness of her heart, told her whole family story. The random visitor of the sauna must have regretted in his heart that he had started this conversation, but out of politeness, he listened to her to the end. As a man who lives solely in accord with his spontaneous impulses, the casual visitor made the decision to try to become a cordial friend to Casey. His name was Tony. Casey was getting more and more involved with Tony. He waited for her after work and took her to bars. Casey loved it when a man could just listen to your complaints and support you. And if he bought her a drink or a cocktail, in Casey's mind that equaled universal love. So Tony became a new meaning of life for her. Now, Casey could talk to him day and night. If Mickey or Selena were in a bad mood again, she could write or call Tony at any time. He would find time to take her to a bar, listen to her, and then spend a pleasant evening in solitude. Mickey was most worried about the children on a long business trip. The day before, he had sat Casey across from him and urged her to be more attentive and responsible for just a couple of weeks until he returned from his business trip. Casey took it all in stride again, but as soon as Mickey left, Casey asked her neighbor to watch the kids and went on the trip Tony had been asking her to take for a long time. Casey returned from her trip just before Mickey arrived, but the trouble was their son Frederick seemed a little sick. Both of his eyes were swollen shut and almost completely closed. Casey rebuked her neighbor for not keeping a good eye on him. When Mickey returned from his business trip and saw his son in such a state, he was furious. He decided to take Frederick to the doctor that same evening. The doctor examined the child and shook his head. It is an infectious disease that affects the eyeballs very quickly. It's especially dangerous for children. I'll certainly try to treat it now, but you're running out of time. Your son is at risk of losing his sight completely, the doctor said. Indeed, Frederick's eyes began to itch and ache right after Casey left for her trip. By the time she returned, the damage to his eyes was extensive and the boy had almost stopped seeing. Mickey expressed all his anger and resentment toward Casey. She, on the other hand, saw no fault in it. She still believes that Mickey just doesn't let her live the life she wants. Especially since Tony assures her that he does. That night, Casey couldn't take it any longer and expressed everything she had in her heart. You restrict me from everything. You didn't like it when I stayed home. I got a job and found myself. Now I finally feel like a free person. But you don't want to respect that. I'm a human being too. And I have the right to live my life the way I want said Casey. Casey, for God's sake, I too, dream of you living a full life. But now that you're a mother of two children, isn't it time to consider them in your life? Do you feel like you can leave the house at any time to go out with your friends and party until morning? And mind you, this doesn't happen on holidays or on a schedule. It's your normal way of life. You reproach me with limitation. But do you have any standards of life yourself? Mickey asked. 
You're always torturing me with your conditions and demands, but it's different with Tony. He understands and supports me. I can have fun with him and talk to him. Not like you and your family, who have to do everything according to a set of rules. Casey blurted out. Mickey had a vague idea, of course, that working in an entertainment establishment was very much to Casey's liking. But he hadn't expected her to find another entertainer so quickly and to believe that it was the highest of feelings for life. By then, he'd had enough of that kind of life. As a result of that evening's arguments, they decided to part ways. Mickey felt it was right for the children to be raised by a hired nanny or their grandmother. Casey packed her things and left for Tony's. Mickey didn't bother to stop her. He was more concerned about Frederick's health. According to the doctor, only a major operation could restore his sight. And before the operation, someone should take care of the children. Selena, of course, had taken over completely. Mickey has decided to redouble his efforts at work to save up the money for the operation as soon as possible. He had to hurry up because Frederick would soon be starting preschool and then it wouldn't be long before school. Changes were on the way for the second family. Julia only now noticed how much John had changed lately. He'd grown cold to her, where before he would only stay at work for a few hours. Now he might stay all night or even several nights. Julia was afraid to suspect him of cheating. She realized that if she judged based only on her assumptions, it would mislead her even more. And in order not to make mistakes in relationships, she needed to be very patient and judicious. Her past experience is a testament to that. How many times she could give in to the impulse of her emotions and lose her relationship with John for no good reason. So she decided not to make any decisions until she sees with her own eyes John's infidelity or another reason for his cooling off. Eva is already big enough, goes to kindergarten and dreams of going to school sooner. Julia intends to go to work soon and distract herself from bad thoughts about John. Could it be that sitting on such a long maternity leave, she too has become monotonous and uninteresting for John. On one such evening, John arrived unexpectedly early. He was drunk, something Julia had not observed him doing before. Little Eva missed her father and was now trying to draw attention to herself in every possible way. Julia noticed this and said, Since you're home, why don't you and Eva take a walk while I clean the house and make dinner? Don't you have time to walk the baby all day? John said in surprise. We go out with her every day. Can't you see she misses you? Both parents are important to a child. I don't understand your reaction, Julia said in a calm tone. Both parents? Here I am, for example, an adult child, almost five years out of touch with my parents. What am I supposed to do? John came very close and looked at Julia angrily. Julia was dumbfounded by John's unexpected behavior. She seemed to realize where her husband wanted to take the conversation. While she was trying to answer, John continued his claims. Julia, do you think it's okay that I don't talk to my parents or even try? As a mom, you're supposed to be better at this than I am. Or do you still think my parents are our enemies? Julia realized that she had been hesitant to talk to John about it for such a long time. She'd realized for a long time that she and John would sooner or later have to resolve the issue with her parents and most likely make the first step toward reconciliation. Only she knew John's adamant nature and had been hesitant to suggest it to him. And now she realizes that she was too late with this conversation. That night, Julia clearly realized that John felt resentment and anger towards Julia for not communicating with his parents. Like a reasonable woman, instead of returning resentment and recriminations, she began to think of ways to repair John's relationship with his parents. Eventually, she was able to formulate a clear plan. Mallory's birthday was coming up. Under this pretext, they will visit the parents with gifts, show them a granddaughter, and Julia will try to get Mallory back to her. But these plans were not to be. A couple days later, John came home drunk again. 
He had gotten caught up in some little thing and turned it into a big family scandal. This time Julia learned something else new. John threatened to kick her out of the house and Eva would stay with him. But Julia didn't understand why she deserved such an attitude. Her beloved husband didn't bother to explain. From that moment on, constant recriminations and scandals became a common occurrence in Julia's family life. It was little Eva who suffered the most. She began to sleep badly at night and practically refused to eat. After a while, her hair began to fall out. Then Julia became angry too. She decided to put an end to these endless conflicts, no matter what it cost her. She only had to look closely at his behavior to understand the reason for it. He had obviously been hiding something from her for a long time, but he had no desire to hide it any longer. In such cases, modern people are always helped by cell phones. Julia had never allowed herself to violate her husband's personal boundaries before, but today she realized that she had to deal with everything urgently and make important decisions. She reached for John's cell phone with these thoughts in mind. She wasn't too surprised when she found correspondence with someone named Sarah. There she saw various photos of Sarah and recognized her at once. It was the same lady who approached Julia at the corporate party and assured her that she and John were in great love. Then Julia took it for another intrigue of her enemies. Turns out she was very wrong. Judging by the correspondence, Sarah and John have gone very far. They have been living as a family for a long time and making common plans for the future. According to Sarah's messages, she has now pushed John into a narrow framework and set conditions for him to choose one of two women. Of course, Sarah makes it clear by the word choice that it's eliminating Julia and starting a new life with her. At that moment, John came out of the bathroom and saw Julia with his phone in her hands. Julia didn't pretend that nothing had happened. She was even relieved that the situation was finally clearer. John too, seemed to have been waiting for this moment for a long time. Julia silently began to pack her daughter's things and put them in her suitcase. John saw the whole process and did not react. Couldn't you just say it without these protracted scandals that have been going on for almost six months? Julia was talking to herself. Julia has a long journey ahead of her as her parents live in another area. But Julia did not want to go to them. She had already thought out her future life. She and Eva would get to the capital. She would put her in a kindergarten, find a job, solve the housing problem, and then she would go to her parents and tell them about everything. And maybe John will still come to his senses and make a step forward during this time. In this case, Julia is ready to think everything over and once again try to save the family. But now she sees no point in it as John is completely infatuated with Sarah and in his picture of the world Julia is still an extra person. As Julia packed two suitcases and headed for the exit, John stopped her. Take only your things. Eva will stay with me, he said in a determined tone. You'll have a new life now. Eva is still young and she has suffered enough from our fights with you. She needs care and peace, so I will take her with me anyway, Julia said. Where will you take her? You have no job, no place to live. I won't let my child suffer a miserable existence. Please don't forget that Eve is the daughter of the Weasley family. She's entitled to a certain standard of living, John said, shocking Julia once again. The long argument turned into a loud scandal. As a result, John pushed Julia so that she fell to the floor. While she got up and came to her senses, he took her apartment keys, locked the door from the outside and left. Julia had intended to pick up Eva from the daycare center and go straight to the train station. Now she wouldn't get to the daycare center either. She tried to call John and talk to him, but he dropped her calls. Julia hoped to the last minute that John would pick Eva up from the daycare center and bring her home in the evening. But in the evening, neither John nor Eva was there. She continued to call John persistently until she realized that he had finally blacklisted her. John showed up well past midnight, 
He was drunk again and incredibly angry with Julia. Where's Eva? Did you pick her up from daycare? Julia asked. Don't worry about Eve. She's part of the Weasley family. It's about time she met her folks. I picked her up from preschool and took her to her parents' house. She's immensely loved and spoiled there. You can go wherever you want now. John opened the front door of the apartment and pointed his finger toward the exit. John, come on. Eve's just a little girl. You can't keep me away from her. You tell me what I've done to deserve this punishment. I'm ready to let you go. I've always been ready to reconcile with your parents and try endlessly to win their favor. You're wrong if you think I've separated you from them. John, let's calmly discuss everything and make a decision together. She we pleaded, but it was useless. John didn't listen to her words. He first pushed her suitcase out the door, then took her by the arm and pushed her out onto the landing. Julia realized that she had failed in her fight for her love. If she had been able to defeat all the intrigues thanks to John's love and support, what about now that he had betrayed her? Julia wandered around the city all night with her suitcase. In the morning, she decided to go to John's parents and try to talk to them. Her goal was to get her daughter back at any cost. Early in the morning, she pulled up in a cab to John's parents' house. She pressed the doorbell and it didn't take long for the answer to come. Someone came to the door, opened it, and looked at Julia questioningly. Hello, I'm here to see Mallory and Jacob, Julia said. She wondered if the strange woman who answered the door was the Weasley's new maid, or one of the other household helpers. I'm sorry, you mean the Weasleys? They sold the house six months ago and moved out. We're the owners now, and we don't know the Weasley's new address, the strange woman said. Julia apologized for the disturbance, walked away from the gate, sat down under the fence, and tried to figure out how she could find the Weasley family. After a while, she got up and went around to all the neighbors, hoping to find out some information about the Weasley's new place of residence. But the Weasleys were not in the habit of talking to their neighbors. Consequently, none of the neighbors even knew that the Weasleys had moved here at all. That was the first day of Julia's vagabonding. She didn't have much money on her. If she spent it on a night in a hotel now, there would be no money left for the journey. So she decided to spend the night at the nearest train station. Early the next day, she arrived at John's office and waited for him in the parking lot. It wasn't hard to catch John. Julia saw his car and came running. It was the same Sarah who got out of the car first then John. Julia's attempts to talk to John were fruitless. He pushed Julia away from him and quickened his stride, heading for the entrance to his office. Sarah watched sullenly, then smorted in his wake, and together they hid behind the glass door of the business center. After three days of such tossing around, Julia realized that it was useless to fight for her daughter. She herself was exhausted during this time. She was not used to living on the streets. Julia decided to get to the city, there to try to organize her life, to gain new strength, and with the help of a lawyer to get justice. Tired, battered, and shabby, Julia had a hard time getting to the bus station and boarding the train. A few years earlier, Mickey's family had suffered a great sorrow. His eldest son had lost his eyesight because of his mother Casey's negligence. Thankfully, at the time, Grandma Selena was alive and well. She took the children to her and took care of them. Mickey then set a goal to do the operation at any cost and restore his son's sight before he went to school. But when he saved up the necessary amount of money, it turned out that Frederick had a whole bunch of other diseases that did not allow him to undergo the operation. Doctors advised to cure other diseases first and then only to perform eye surgery. So Frederick will be late for school for at least two years. In the meantime, he has to attend a school for the blind. Selena prayed and dreamed that her grandson Frederick would finally regain his sight and become a full-fledged child. But by then, she herself was already on the brink. Her life was cut short by an unexpected stroke. Frederick and Ariana, 
who was so accustomed to their grandmother, suffered the most, they missed her terribly. Then Mickey took them to his house and found a good nanny. The nanny helped them with organizing their lives until Frederick's surgery. Fortunately, the surgery was a success. The very next day, Frederick opened his eyes very cautiously and saw his daddy Mickey and his little sister Ariana in front of him. There was no limit to his happiness. He had lived a blind life for more than five years. Now he had to reacquaint himself with his surroundings and it was a process he was enjoying immensely. Frederick couldn't seem to get enough of the world. Mickey too was endlessly happy about it. He took a vacation to spend as much time as possible with his children. The single father and his two children walked in the parks from morning to night, exploring nature, drawing and learning about the world of colors. Mickey was very inspired by his deep experience of being a father. Amidst the inspiration, the idea came to him to take a family trip across the country. After a couple of days, he gathered his children and traveled by train to the Tumen region to explore the unseen mysteries of the domestic expanse. There they spent an exciting 14 days and seemed a little even tired of the experience. They were looking forward to finally getting on the train and starting to explore the new pictures outside the window again. Mickey and the two children were not far from Julia, who was already fast asleep from fatigue. The train had already moved off. Frederick and Ariana did not sit quietly for long. After a few minutes, Frederick's curiosity about the world awoke again. He stared wide-eyed at the scenery outside the windows and continued to ask his father questions. Daddy, what color are the mountains? The mountains are dark blue or gray. It all depends on the specific area. You say the mountains are dark blue and your pants are dark blue too. But then why don't they look alike? Frederick asked. Because it's clothes and there's mountains, nature, Ariana tried to appear omniscient and answered her brother's questions. Daddy, what color is auntie's suitcase? Frederick asked again. It's burgundy, son. And burgundy is also pomegranate and tomato, Ariana added. No daughter, pomegranate is scarlet. Tomatoes are red or pink. Mickey patiently explained to his children. I get it. Pink is like paint on this aunt's lips, Frederick said. He came close to Julia and almost poked his finger into her lips. If Julia had heard the annoying talk before, she opened her eyes abruptly and raised her head. Her body was shattered with fatigue. Her head ached, and she really wanted to sleep in this position for at least an hour. But this boy had turned his full attention to Julia and was asking his father about every detail of her clothes. Julia herself didn't notice how she had flared up at one point. Man, maybe you can calm your child down. He asks too many questions. At this age, he should know a lot and certainly control his behavior in society, she said. Mickey clearly didn't like that remark. Lady, don't be rude. You don't know anything about my son, and I won't let anyone make any remarks about him, said Mickey. It's worse for you. Your son will grow up to be a rude boar. Julia didn't recognize herself in her emotions. My son has recently started to see the world. Before that, he was blind. He is only in his second month of exploring his surroundings with his eyesight. I am doing my best to keep him looking at the world with an exploratory eye. Mickey said and switched to talking to his son. And you probably don't have children of your own, so you don't know anything about this business, the older woman said toward Julia. Don't worry, Grandma. I'm the best mother in the world and I'll prove it. In the meantime, the fate of my child will be decided by an evil woman like you, Julia replied. So rude, snorted the older woman and turned away to the window. Where's the mother of your children? Isn't it hard for you to be a single father? Another middle-aged woman approached Mickey. Mickey decided to ignore the curious questions of the others and continued talking to his children. But Julia was no longer able to control her emotions. She decided to answer instead of Mickey. Most likely his family survived the mother of those children and now they are building the most caring relatives, Julia said, closed her eyes 
and pretended to be asleep. Mickey was confused. On the one hand, the lady had hit the mark. On the other hand, she wasn't quite right. So he decided to answer her. Society likes to blame men for not being involved enough in raising children. But even among mothers, there are unworthy ones who can leave their children in the middle of nowhere and quietly go on a long journey. Now Mickey's words stick like an arrow into Julia's heart. For the past few days, Julia has been frantically trying to ward off the idea that she would be an unworthy mother if she left her daughter with her relatives and went away on her own, and then a complete stranger steps on her heartstrings. Young people, everything happens when you are young. Most importantly, if you sincerely love your family and do not betray yourselves in this love, then any hardships in life will be solved. It seems to me that you both have faced great adversity in your married life and each of you blames the other. We don't know the whole situation, that may be the case, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that you manage once again to find your strength and move on. Whether it is a direction to meet your family or from your family, let your hearts decide, said the elderly man with glasses. The rest of the way, they each thought about their own thoughts. Julia tried to imagine John in Mickey's place. Would he be able to care for his family as much as he did and protect it from outside attacks? Until recently, she believed that was the case, but it turned out not to be so at all. Mickey has realized from Julia's words that she has been forcibly deprived of her child and is depressed about it. He now tries to imagine Casey, who has never suffered much in her life for the sake of her children. At another station, the train stopped and passengers began to get off. Julia deliberately waited to be the last to get off. Wandering around in the unfamiliar area looking for a coffee machine, she found herself once again, not far from Mickey and his children. They were picking out ice cream. Hey dad, you can't let kids eat ice cream in this weather. The kid's just out of surgery, so he needs to be careful of inflammation, Julia said and went on her way. Mickey did just that. He persuaded the children to give up ice cream and buy something else that wasn't cold. The children also clearly heard the words of the strange aunt and did not object. The train finally arrived at the final station. By this time, Julia had had enough sleep and she felt energized. Auntie, you have beautiful hair, said little Ariana to Julia, touching her hair with her little hands. Julia felt awful that her daughter had stayed somewhere else, while she was already in another city thousands of kilometers away. Ariana reminded her of Eve, who also admired her mother's hair and loved to mess with it for hours, trying to make it look nice. Julia looked at the girl silently, hugged her, and held her to her chest. At that moment, tears streamed from her eyes. She had barely contained her emotions for so many days, and now it seemed she no longer had the strength to control them. Mickey and Frederick looked at Julia and Ariana in surprise. Don't cry, all your mascara will run out and smear all your makeup, Ariana said, and wiped Julia's tears away with her little hands. On the one hand, Julia was amused that this little princess was as knowledgeable about women's issues as her Eva was. On the other hand, when now she could see her daughter and hold her to her chest, would the Weasley family allow her to do that? You'll forgive me for my emotions, I couldn't help myself. Julia said goodbye and looked at Mickey. We all do. Which way are you going now? Mickey asked. I don't know yet, this is my first time in DC in the last five years. My parents live in a different area. I used to have friends, so I'll try to find them for the first time, Julia said. Come with us, we have plenty of room in the apartment. You can rest and then start looking for your friends, Mickey suggested. Auntie, come with us, I'll show you my makeup. If you want, I'll do your hair, said little Ariana. Julia realized that she could not let go of this little girl. So she didn't resist the invitation to spend the night. It turned out that Mickey lived in a spacious and well-maintained apartment. Despite the absence of female hands, the apartment was perfectly clean and cozy. 
That night, Mickey ordered pizza. They had dinner together. The kids kept sharing their impressions and boring Julia with their questions. When it was time for bed, Mickey made Julia's bed in the living room. He himself went to tuck the kids into their rooms. The next morning, Julia intended to leave before the family woke up, but she didn't succeed. As soon as she tiptoed out of the bathroom, Ariana came running to her. I promised you a beautiful hair though. Let's do it now, shall we? She suggested. Julia felt she could not refuse to let her little hands play with her hair for anything in the world. Her longing for her daughter was tearing at every fiber of her being. As much as Julia forced herself to leave early from the house of strangers, her soul did not want to part with Ariana. She promised herself that she would only make breakfast for the children and then leave to find her friends. When breakfast was ready, Ariana asked to stay and have breakfast together. At this time, the babysitter came to see them. Mickey sent the children for a walk with the nanny and started talking to Julia. I can see you're having a hard time. What happened? What events have caused you to be so depressed? Mickey asked. Julia told the whole story of her family life. Mickey realized that the girl was in a rather difficult situation and offered to help her with work. But Julia thanked him for his participation and refused to help. She kept hoping to find her friend Elizabeth, who had graduated from law school and was building a career in her specialty the last time they saw each other. Julia hoped to get some counseling from her friend and then think about setting up her life. Mickey walked her to the door and told her that if she didn't find her friend by tonight, she could go back to his apartment. Julia wandered around the city all day, trying to remember the address of Elizabeth's office, but the day ended without success. In the evening, it was necessary to return to Mickey's family again. The children, especially Ariana, was immensely happy to have Julia back. After a few days of empty attempts to find anyone she knew, Julia realized that she had been wrong to refuse Mickey's help in finding a job. She reminded him about it, and in two days Julia's job search was solved successfully. She was hired by a company where Mickey's friend is the manager. Julia started working and continued to live in Mickey's apartment. She first offered some money for living expenses. Mickey ignored the question and said nothing. Her longing for her daughter was somewhat assuaged by Ariana. Frederick turned out to be a very sociable guy, so Julia quickly made friends with him. Julia got her first paycheck, and by that time she had looked for an apartment to rent. But before she moved in, she went to a lawyer for advice. He promised to help, but he had to drive her to the Tumen region at his own expense and pay a lot of additional expenses. All this requires additional time. The children accepted Julia's move with sadness. Julia promised to invite them to a housewarming party in the near future. The housewarming took place exactly one week later. Frederick and Ariana were sad that Julia didn't want to stay with them. They were even sadder that Daddy would soon go to work and would have little time for them. On one of the most ordinary days, Mickey called Julia and asked in an excited voice if Frederick and Ariana had come to see her. Julia was surprised because the children had definitely not come to see her. Mickey revealed that the children had left a note saying that they had gone to visit Julia. Julia wanted to take a cab and rush over to Mickey's house, but what would happen if the children came to her house while she was away? And the time was getting closer to evening. Mickey went to look for the children in the nearest neighborhood while Julia waited for them at her house. A lot of time had passed and there was no word from the kids. Mickey had to go to the police. The police were just looking for Mickey's contacts at the time. It turned out that Frederick and Ariana really decided to go to visit Julia, but on the way they got lost. They were found by the police and taken to the police station. When Mickey and Julia arrived at the police station, the time was well past midnight. After what had happened, Mickey decided to have a serious talk with Julia. Whereas before he had offered Julia a life together as help, now he was asking her for the sake of his children. He even promised to pay Julia just to keep his children happy. 
but Julia took offense at the offer to pay her money for company. She agreed to move back into Mickey's apartment. By that time, she realized that she had become attached to Ariana and missed her as much as she missed her daughter. Now Julia lives with Mickey and takes care of the children. The neighbors are already whispering that Mickey finally got married and the new bride seems to be not bad. But Julia wasn't interested in a new relationship. She is still thinking day and night about how to take Eva back to her place. Meanwhile, Mickey was surprised to discover every day something new of a woman's real warmth and care for her family. It seemed to come so naturally to Julia. She easily found a common language with Mickey's children. She knew how to persuade them and pick up the right words. She enjoyed cooking delicious meals and was masterful at getting them ready to go out. In addition, Mickey had long ago noticed that Julia was quite good looking. It was true that lately she had neglected her appearance a little, but Mickey had a clear idea of how stunning she would look if she gave herself some money and time. He decided to give her that treat. The following weekend, he gave Julia a certain amount of money and urged her to spend it on herself. Julia did so. In the evening, she returned home a refreshed young girl with a twinkle in her eye. Mickey realized that he could now gradually make steps toward winning Julia's favor, but he was very worried that his initiative to enter into a relationship might offend her. She had recently gone through a difficult breakup and was pining madly for her daughter. One night, when the children had gone to bed, Julia was talking about her daughter and showed Mickey a long ago family photo. Mickey looked at the photo and was literally stunned. So this is your ex-husband? Mickey asked. Do you know him? Julia asked. A pleasant smile appeared on Mickey's face. That's John. He studied finance and worked in a trading company while he was still a student. And he was also boxing at the time, going to a gym in the old Arbat neighborhood. Am I right? Mickey asked. That's right. That's when he and I first met and dated, Julia said. Now give me his phone number, Mickey said. Julia dictated his phone number. Mickey wrote it down and said, I can't promise you anything, but I'll try my best to talk to him. Julia didn't pay much attention to Mickey's words. What could he do from a distance? This matter can only be settled through the courts, she thought. Julia was preparing breakfast for the children when the doorbell rang. She looked through the peephole and saw a strange woman at the door. Julia opened the door. Hello. Who do you want? Julia asked. And good luck to you. And who are you? The woman, who smelled a pungent odor of booze, looked indignantly at me. At this point, Mickey heard extraneous conversations and went to the door. The unfamiliar woman saw Mickey and immediately turned to attacking him. Mickey, how could you let a strange woman into your house? Where are our children? The children need their own mother, not some strange woman. I want to see my children. A drunken Casey demanded to see her long forgotten children in high tones. Despite Mickey's attempts to calm her down and send her back, she managed to make her way into the hallway of the apartment. Barely on her feet, Casey called her children by name, but Frederick and Ariana only looked out of their rooms and back shut themselves in there. Mickey managed to get Casey out with great difficulty. During this time, Julia managed to find out that the man for whom Casey left her children and her family had abandoned her long ago. Casey now has nowhere to live and no job. It was an amazing coincidence that it was during such a period that she remembered her children. However, there was still more to come. Casey now began to visit Mickey and Julia almost every day. The children absolutely refused to see the woman. They didn't even seem to remember her. But Casey continued to demand that Julie get out of here and vacate her apartment immediately. Attempts to peacefully negotiate and resolve the matter were unsuccessful. At one point, Julia felt genuinely sorry for Casey as a woman, but it was useless to talk to her about it. Then Julia decided to try a somewhat unconventional approach to solving the problem. From the family album, she took out some good photos of Casey 
and posted them on a dating site. There were quite a few offers. Julia carefully selected each of them to find a more or less suitable match for Casey. Julia honestly told all the men that she was looking for an easygoing man for her friend. From the candidate, she demanded serious intentions, a job and a great desire to meet a girl with whom you can live your life without much worry. And there were quite a few of them. Julia gave Casey's phone number to a few selected candidates and strictly warned that the bride did not know about the dating site and the efforts of her mysterious friend. For potential candidates, it did not prove to be a problem. After three days, Mickey's apartment was quiet. There was no more banging on the door or drunken debauches on the landing. Julia realized that it was likely that one of the potential candidates had found a way to approach Casey, but Mickey didn't know the whole story and was worried sick trying to think of a solution to Casey's attacks. Julia left him alone with these worries so as not to seem too resourceful. On one of the usual days towards evening, Mickey called Julia and asked her to come home early. He promised that there would be a surprise waiting for her at home. Julia thought that surely Mickey must have bought something or wanted to give her money for shopping and salons again. What was her surprise when, after coming home from work, she opened the door to Mickey's apartment and saw her Eve in the living room? She couldn't believe her eyes. It turned out that Eva had missed her mom a lot too. They were sitting in each other's arms right on the floor and couldn't get enough of each other. Only then did Julia become curious as to how Mickey had managed to get her daughter. Mickey only smiled enigmatically and promised to tell her everything at the family dinner. I was walking home from practice one day and noticed that in the darkness behind the garages two big guys were beating up one guy. The victim was almost unconscious. He had no strength left to resist or beg for mercy. The bullies were beating him brutally. I decided to stand up for this guy. I managed to quickly calm the two men down so that they ran away in the darkness, blazing their heels. The guy had already lost a lot of blood and was lying half dead. So I took him to the hospital and a couple days later he came to. By that time, even his parents had arrived. I visited him a couple times, just for humanity's sake. Then his parents thanked me immensely and offered to ask me anything I wanted from them. Like an honorable man, I didn't ask for anything and just disappeared from these people's lives. But I do remember John's face. After I was discharged from the hospital, he found me and bought me a couple of beers. That was the end of our acquaintance. So the other day, I called his parents and reminded them of the thanks they wanted to give me years ago. I told them the truth and asked them to give Eva away. So today, John brought Eve himself. I promised the Weasleys that I myself would personally take care of their granddaughter as my daughter. Eve will be a sister to Ariana. All that's left is to get you to agree, Mickey told Julie. Julia thought for a moment that everything was happening as if in a dream. When Ariana and Eva hugged her from both sides, she realized that this was not a dream, but the real life she deserved. If I understand correctly, did you just propose to me? Julia turned to Mickey. Mickey only smiled back. Well, then I mean to consult with the people who are important to me, Julia said. Then she turned to the children and asked, Frederick, Ariana and Eva, are you ready to be brothers and sisters to each other and call Mickey and me mom and dad? Asked Julia. Yes, the children answered with glee. If the most important people say yes, how could I say no? Then I'll say yes too, Julia said. A couple of weeks later, Mickey and Julia were officially married. There were no more marital problems along the way. Maybe it was because they had paid a high price for happiness in advance. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.